Welcome, friends, to Breakfast in the Ruins, a Michael Moorcock flavoured podcast. On this show, we're continuing on a general theme that seems to have been preoccupying us for a while now, albeit on this occasion it came from a general conversation with returning guest Andrew Netty about stuff we wanted to talk about for future episodes of the show. Back in the early 80s, when I was perusing and burying myself in those piles of old paperbacks that were coming to me via Pops, a kind of underground railroad of pulp that ran from the various second-hand bookshops and market stalls in Hull, usually Motherby's and Crystal Books, on through my Uncle John, and eventually to Pops's little coffee table, I came across one that had a vivid cover, a head and shoulders shot of an old geezer in front of the frame of a satellite dish. It seemed oddly familiar, in that I perhaps dimly recognised the old fellow at the time as John Mills, as he was a regular fixture on the telly, in films and TV shows. And the name of the novel, Quatermass, despite being an odd and rather unique moniker, also seemed vaguely familiar, despite the fact that, at that time in my life, I don't think I've ever been exposed to any of the TV shows or films that carried that name. But Quatermass, in the 80s, was still a big part of the sci-fi zeitgeist, and had occupied a prominent spot in the British TV and film landscape for well over 20 years, so I suppose I must have had some awareness, even if only by some kind of cultural osmosis. Compared to the garish and lurid covers of the books it sat amongst, I'm surprised now, looking back, that I seized upon it, but perhaps that title carried some kind of aura, a taste of the forbidden. At that time, if a Quatermass film had been on the box, it probably would have been well past my bedtime, and... When I did catch up on some of the Hammer films of the following years, they were consumed in exactly that way when my folks would probably have been down the Botanic on a Friday night, while my sisters and me would indulge in a bit of Friday night horror double bill action and eagerly await my parents' merry return, usually bringing patty and chips along for a lovely salt and vinegar drenched supper. It wouldn't be until many years later that I came to understand the broader impact of Quatermass creator Nigel Neal on the British television landscape. He passed away in 2006 at the age of 84, and I'm going to read a chunk from his Guardian obituary. And it reads, Of all the writers of his time, Nigel Neal, who has died aged 84, came closest to matching H.G. Wells in sensational public impact, as well as the brilliance of his early years. His Quatermass trilogy of science fiction serials, and his adaptation of George Orwell's 1984, mostly performed live in the studio, were among the glories of British television drama throughout the 1950s, and are still seen as such. There were scripts of a vision and excitement that has hardly been equalled and never surpassed, despite all the technical slickery the medium has achieved since. The paradox was that Neil never saw himself as a science fiction author. I'm not really a science fiction fan. I hardly ever read it, he said towards the end of his life. Neither did he ever finger to exploit his triumphs or tout his reputation. He was the least self-promoting of artists, his name absent from Who's Who and all the usual reference books for the craft he adorned for forty years. He continued to work, apparently contentedly, as a consistently distinguished jobbing scriptwriter, proud of his versatility, with TV and film work as various as John Osborne's Look Back in Anger, his first film script, and The Entertainer, Halloween 3 season of The Witch, The Woman in Black by Susan Hill, and Kingsley Amis's Stanley and the Women. Nigel Neal was born in Barrow in Furness, then in Lancashire, but grew up on the Isle of Man. There's always been a traditional belief on the Isle of Man in things you can't quite see, he said. He studied for the Manx Bar, but grew bored. In 1951 he joined the BBC as a scriptwriter. Only two years later came the Quatermass Experiment, directed by the innovative Rudolf Cartier. Neil's fee for it was £250. Its plot, like those of H.G. Wells, was the sheerest hokum. An idealistic government rocket science battling the spread of mind-bending alien vegetable brought home on a spaceship, but the narrative was stomach-clawing, and the underlying metaphor of individuals slowly falling victim to an unprepared-for invasion engrossed an audience caught in real life between the Second World War, the onset of the Cold War, nuclear testing, an epidemic of flying saucer reports, and the starings of the space race. There was dread in the real world in the 1950s. The forces of annihilation were in the hands of fallible, panicking men, yet official propaganda was still jaunty, he said. The BBC didn't have any special effect then. My stories had to be told through characters, and were better for it. In both this and his two equally popular serials, Quatermass 2 in 1955 and Quatermass in the Pit in 1959, Neil, unusually for this time, emerged as an optimist as well as a humanist. 
In all three serials, the enemy was defeated not primarily by force, but by the exercise of human free will. In the last, the foe turned out to be a human mass destructiveness itself. This gave his work at best considerable grandeur. Sandwiched into the triumphant 50s was Neil's astonishingly mature version of 1984, an adaptation that had his usual pace but encompassed the full dread and pity of the novel. The totalitarian ending, which could leave no margin for free will, appalled its audience, led to questions in Parliament, permanently revived Orwell's reputation, and launched two of its players, Peter Cushing and Donald Pleasance, as specialists in the macabre. After that, his career was anticlimactic. Hammer Films commissioned scripts of all three Quatermass stories, which were box office successes and are often re-shown on TV. Neil's name remained a byword for deft, exceptionally imaginative storytelling, but the medium in which he worked best, television, never again used him with any consistent flair. In 1968, he saw one of his ideas surface without acknowledgement in Stanley Kubrick's film 2001 A Space Odyssey. In 1972, the BBC produced his tale The Stone Tape, a technological ghost story still renowned amongst aficionados for the twist in its tale. In 1979, for Telmer Television, he wrote a coda to his old saga. The serial, Quatermass, The Conclusion, was more complex than his previous work and rich in its sense of pity. In 1995, he went back to the subject for the Quatermass memoirs on Radio 3, dedicated to those who remember hiding behind the surf when Quatermass came on. His adventures have gone down in cultural history, said the producer Paul Quinn. Neil was by no means the only author to have been largely wasted by television, and to have seen his status overtaken by soap opera hacks. But his place is secure, alongside Wells, Arthur C. Clarke, John Wyndham and Brian Aldiss, as one of the best, most exciting and most compassionate English science fiction writers of his century. That obituary, by John Izzard, himself a 70-something Cambridge-educated career Guardian arts correspondent of over 40 years, gives a good indication of not only how essential Nigel Neal was to the genre that we hold dear in these parts, but also how highly regarded he was by parts of the arts establishment in Britain. And his reach did extend further too. Whilst his script for Halloween 3 didn't survive contact with a Hollywood studio, it's no coincidence that John Carpenter wrote his film Prince of Darkness under cover of the pseudonym Martin Quatermass. Anyway, enough waffling. When we were deciding what to talk about when we next got together, Andrew and I agreed on the final TV serial from 1979, simply called Quatermass when it was broadcast, but retitled The Quatermass Conclusion when edited to movie length for international release. And that just happens to be the subject of that novelisation I read back in the early 80s, Neil's only novel, as far as I can tell. So sit back and pour an unhealthy measure of gin, or whatever your pleasure may be, Realign your radio telescopes to check for any anomalies, and then join writer, journalist, novelist, pulp scholar, and all-round top bloke, Andrew Netty, and me, as we take a look at Quatermass. back at Derry Toms and Andrew Nettie is back, a researcher, journalist, lover of all things pulp, author of noir novels, Ghost Money, Gunshine and most recently Orphan Road, co-editor of Gale Gangs, Biker Boys and Real Cool Cats, Pulp Fiction and Youth Culture 1950s to 1980 and Sticking It to the Man, Revolution and Counterculture in Pulp and Popular Fiction 1956 to 1980 and of course, as we've talked about before, very specifically on the show, Dangerous Visions and New Worlds, Radical Science Fiction 1950 to 1980. Now there's lots more, but I'm going to stop there because you can actually tell me about this stuff, but welcome back Andrew. Lovely to be here Andy. And what have you been up to in the past year since we talked about N.E.L. Biker novels? Oh, look, I've been working, I've been trying to write another novel, I've been working for the man, I've been, <laughs> I've, I've put together a, another book for PM Press, the same people that did um, Dangerous Visions and New Worlds. That's very exciting and that's out later in the year and that is called Revolution in 35 Millimetre. 
Uh-huh. Let me just give you the full name. It's, it's 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 quite a banger of a name, so I actually have to. And I haven't. It hasn't rolled off my tongue yet. So bear with me. The full name is, yes, Revolution and Thirty Five Millimeter Political Violence and Resistance in Film from the Art House to the Grind House, nineteen sixty to nineteen ninety. Oh, well, that's quite a nice progression from the other three then, isn't it? Yeah, something book-related, which I'm doing with a uh, a New York-based film critic. We've edited it called yeah. Sam Deegan. It's been there, so that's coming out with PM later on cool. in and the w- year. So what kind of um, – I mean, the other ones all consist of various essays and perspectives. So what kind of treats have you got in store in there? Well, this is, this is again, an essay-based book. There's fewer, slightly longer essays, and I suppose it just tries to span that continuum of, of political filmmaking from 1960, probably the start of the war in Algeria, or the end of the war in Algeria, roughly in about 1960, this, and the, the end of French occupation in Algeria, going to the downfall of the Berlin Wall, and it's... <laughs> It's got the, the higher brow material that you would expect, including Giulio Pontecorvo and Goddard and, and, and many other things. And it's also got all kinds of wonderful gr- undiscovered grindhouse treats in it. Oh, very nice. I must say, my discovery of strange grindhouse cinematic treats back in the 80s and 90s is something I'm very, very fond of, so I'll be looking forward to that one. So now, you also write monographs, and we talked at length about your rollerball and Horwitz passions and the monographs that you wrote about those things a couple of years ago when you first came on. But I had a quick look at your webpage earlier, and I recall us talking about the Midnight Movie monographs by East Yorkshire's very own PS Publishing the first time you were on, or maybe the second time you were on. And what do I see there? You have contributed now to a PS publishing monograph. I have, I have. It's yeah. it's an, it was an essay on a book about the Bride of Frankenstein, and and I did an essay on the many brides, the many cinematic brides of Frankenstein that have happened since yeah. the original James Whale film. How did that come about? Because did they just get in touch with you, no, or is it no, something no, that you've God. always had no, a passion no, for? No, 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 um, because. A friend of mine, a good friend of mine, Emma Westwood, was doing a book on The Bride of Frankenstein, a monograph, and she was going to go to the US and they're going to spend time in the stu- in LA researching it, and then COVID happened, and she so that just, that sort of nicks the trip, and she decided to change the the format of the book from a sort of standalone one person monograph to a set of contributive contributed essays there's one on makeup yeah. there's one on whales there's other work there's well there's all kinds there's about there's about 10 essays in the book it's a great it's a great book it looks beautiful too i'm, I'm going to have to end up getting that of course because i think i got the first seven um but that <laughs> sent me to the ps publishing website and now of course there are additional ones there's bride of frankenstein there's manhunter which i don't have and i don't think i got the lay vampires one either just Simply by doing this today, you've cost me another 60 quid. But, you know, I'm, it's I'm all good for PS sorry. Publishing. I'm terribly sorry about that. <laughs> well, weirdly, you know, we we stayed... PS Publishing have been... I, did, I knew they were East Yorkshire-based, but late last year we had a weekend in a little seaside town called Hornsey on the East Yorkshire coast. And the digs we had, when we, t- when we turned right out of our digs to go and uh, have a couple of drinks and a meal, about 10 doors down was... PS Publishing. So, so by some wow. weird coincidence, we stayed like 10 doors down from, I'm guessing it's Pete Crowther's house, but we stayed 10 doors down from PS Publishing. Yeah. So funny little coincidence. Is that like a, a multi story office? There's like a whole fleet of cars and, you know, like. No, it's, it's a really beautiful end terrace, three story Victorian okay, okay. Um, townhouse, and it's gorgeous. That entire terrace of townhouses are beautiful. Um, oh. Hornsey is, uh, I mean, it's it's got some it's got some newer parts, but for the most part, that central part is old Victorian townhouses, okay. and it's yeah, really really nice. So, I, I met Pete once at a, <laughs> at a library with Ramsey Campbell when they were doing readings. No, oh, lovely. And he was, and we went to a pub afterwards. We went to a pub in Hull called the the shit. I forgot the name of the pub. What is it? The old English gentleman? Yeah, the old English gentleman. Of course, and it would be called. Was, it would be called something like that. Of course. You know, yeah, the, yeah. The just, ram, just near the, the ram and steer, or the you know. Yeah, yes. yeah. It was. It was the old English gent, and um, the idea was that they'd set up with the old English gent that they were going to put on a buffet for the authors, their wives, and some of the attendees. So we went along, and the guy behind the bar knew nothing about it. So he said, "Well, I could do you some chip butters." 
So we ended up sitting and having a pint and eating chip butties with uh-huh. Ramsey Campbell, Pete Crowther, and their that's other actually, half. That's <laughs> actually high quality food in England, isn't it? Chip yeah. Butties. Well, uh, I enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's hell. right. I'm, I'm partial to a chip butty. <laughs> so, but it, you know, just because that had happened once, I thought, yeah, that doesn't really entitle you to go knock on his door and say, "Hi, Pete, do you want to come for a pint?" <laughs> oh, you never know. You might like it. You might like yeah. it. So that might be a friend, friendly chap. You never know. Yeah, true. One day, perhaps. One day. We'll be back. Well, you've got plenty going on then. And of course, you also released Orphan Road last year, which is your I did. third it's crime novel. novel. Orphan Read. I'm working on other things. So there's a bit a bit going on at the moment. And uh, yeah, you know, keeping busy. Trying to keep pumping good, good. it out. Yeah. Good, good. But what are we here to talk about today? Now, why on earth did we decide to talk about Professor Bernard Quatermass? I can't well, actually remember how this came about. Oh, I think we were just tossing around ideas, and actually, it was the it was the third Bernard Quatermass film in particular, the nineteen seventy nine one Quatermass. Yes, I think it's. Uh, I don't know why it is, but I think I certainly maybe it's because I had remembered watching it in a shared house on VHS in Collingwood, Melbourne, back in. It must have been very soon after it came out. Yeah. And uh, I was trying because then I rewatched it recently, of course, for this show, and I was trying to think. Did I find it as unnerving back in that house in Collingwood mm. as I as I did when I watched it now? I mean, probably I was mm. I was probably three sheets to the wind back in that house in that student <laughs> house in Collingwood, so that probably that tampered it down probably. But watching it now, I just thought, yeah, well, history's really ca- caught up with this film in some respects. It's it's very good. Was that your actual introduction to Quatermass? Oh, definitely, definitely. And then I didn't go back and I mean, I watched I watched the three film, I watched all four films over a period of some months for this podcast because, of course, we mm. have a long lead up time for these things. Mm. Um, and that was my introduction to Bernard Quatermass. And of course, I didn't realise when I saw it back in the very late eighties, very early nineties. I can't remember. Maybe it was about nineteen ninety just what a sort of popular culture phenomenon Mm. he was in the UK and how much his other films, his television series, all of that. I I sort of only discovered that much later. Yeah. My introduction was the same serial sort of, but it wasn't actually watching it on the box because when, when it was first broadcast, I was seven. And um, for whatever reason, I probably wasn't old enough to stay up and watch it. But a few years later in the 80s, I got the ace book edition of Nigel Neal's novelisation yes. of the Quatermass serial. Yes. Now, I suppose to, to people who, who don't know Quatermass, the series was called Quatermass and this book was called Quatermass, but it was actually the fourth Quatermass story mm. because there were two BBC serials in the in the 50s, one in the 60s, and then this was one in the 70s. And it went through quite a lot of development. It flipped between the BBC and ITV. But this was my very first introduction to Quatermass. And it came to me via Pops, just like most other paperback books did. And I probably saw Quatermass in the Pit next a couple of years later. But because of the content of this book, Quatermass in the Pit was quite jarring and incongruous. <laughs> because in Quatermass in the Pit, I mean, which is a great film, I, I do have the serial on Blu-ray somewhere. It was restored and remastered in HD. And, well, as HD as a TV serial can be. But I've never got around to watching it, so I only really know the film with Andrew Keir. And because this book is basically, it may as well be an NEL Britain is Fucked novel of the type that we have a deep fondness for. And love. So actually going, yeah, so going back and watching... Quatermass in the Pit, and then subsequently the original 50s black and white Hammer films with Brian Don Levy as Quatermass was quite a departure from what I kind of expected. But I absolutely adore this book. And I first saw the serial probably, I think I saw the TV condensed version that was put out as a film, wasn't it? And I might have seen that on VHS but it was grainy and crappy, and I was probably too worse for worse. So I didn't really ever watch the full four-episode serial until I got it in HD on Blu-ray about three years ago. And I did enjoy it, but I've got thoughts about how it compares to the novel. Inevitably, when you start with one medium over another, you always tend to compare. But even though I liked Quatermass in the Pit, and I enjoyed the 50s Hammer movies, 
and they certainly have their charms, not least of which is because of their influence on the first couple of seasons of John Pertwee's run of Doctor Who, which is super, super Quatermass grounded. I mean, the, the amount of times he ends up running around a chemical plant that looks exactly like the one from <laughs> Quatermass 2, for example, <laughs> is uh, astonishing. And I think yes, it's the... Yes. I think it's the claws of Axos where the spaghetti monsters are killing soldiers. That might as well be a scene from Quatermass 2 as well. No, I was going to say, I watched them in order, actually, for this show. I watched mm. The Quatermass Experiment in 1955, which was directed by Val Guest. I did Quatermass 2, The Enemy in Space, in 1957. I did Quatermass and the Pit in 1967, which I had seen before and I, I really mm. like and I rewatched. And then I rewatched. The uh, Quatermass 1979 serial again. And I was fascinated by there is a real trajectory mm. in those films. You know, in the Quatermass experiment, so you've got this American, I believe, I think it was Brian Don Levy was American. I'm pretty sure he was. He he's, was. He's playing Bernard Quatermass and he's got this sort of, you know, he's, there's a plane crash, there's a spaceship crash. And there's, I think they send, they send three astronauts up and only one comes back and they put him in this military hospital and he starts to mutate into this sort of plant-based being, very Doctor Who, very Doctor mm. Who, mutates into this, to this homicidal half-human, half-plant being. And it's turned out that while they've been in space, they've had contact with alien life, which has killed two of the astronauts and infected the third. And then, of course, there's a manhunt for the astronaut and he transforms himself into a giant plant that can reproduce itself. And eventually, because he's such a, a jolly good scientific swat, Bernard Quatermass <laughs> um, defeats him. But in the, in the film, you know, he's just, he's, Quatermass is cold. He's yeah. this technological determinist. He does not care about the astronauts. He's arrogant. He's a sort of maverick scientist too. And he's, and no sooner has he defeated this alien than he's he's off to launch another rocket. He's actually learnt nothing at all. It's like, oh, yes, let's, let's go and put another rocket up now. And then Quatermass, the enemy of space, another Val Guest one, Don Levy again, very, very similar. And then, and I mean, I'm, I'm traversing a lot of territory here, and I'm sure we can go back and pick out some of the nuances later. Then in yeah. Quatermass and the Pit, it's a bit more counterculturally. It's a bit more Quatermass's mellowed a bit. Mm -hmm. It's Quatermass and it's science and it's superstition. And then we go all the way up to 1979, lovely progression, where Quatermass by 1979 is this depressed, disillusioned old scientist who actually is kind of ashamed of every, everything he's done as the father of Britain's rocket program. And yeah. now he just wants to find his daughter, who's his granddaughter who's disappeared. And I just think it's a lovely – it's actually – I don't know if they meant that. I don't know if Neil meant that, but it's a, it's a wonderful progression from this cold, arrogant, scientific man to this quite warm, vulnerable old guy who's who's you know a mu much more of a humanist has a much more humanist take now on on science and what's going on than this yeah. arrogant bastard who was in the nineteen fifty first nineteen fifty five film. We did exactly the same thing. Phil had never seen. I think she'd seen bits of the black and white ones. I think she'd seen a bit of Quatermass in the Pit when she was a kid. And she had watched the Quatermass serial with me when I got it on Blu-ray, but couldn't really remember anything about it. So we did watch them all. And I ended up loving Brian Donlevy. And he's, I think he's my favourite Quatermass because he is such a hard-ass. He is like a hard-bitten, cold, noir detective in the middle of all this science. And almost virgin on neurodivergent in his driven obsessions. I think it's fantastic. And Phil, Phil was like, he's just a complete prick. He is a complete <laughs> prick. There's, there's, and, there's, you know, he's, he's kind of the sexist old bastard in the first couple yeah. of films, and he's mellowed by number three by the time they're there. Yeah. In the original serials, he wasn't like this oh. at all. It's very much Brian Don Levy's take on the Quatermass character. I think in the serials, he is still driven and cold and single-minded. But Don Levy plays him like a, a complete ass. But I love him because his, his line delivery is like... Don Levy was like a... He was big in the 30s and 40s in American cinema, but mostly played in 
he played in a lot of like you know wacky comedies and things like yeah, that. He wasn't. I thought he was in a bit of film noir as well. Yeah, he, he did I... noir as well. But I think his, his his biggest roles were in like you know sort of oddball comedies and things yeah. like that. So he, he did all that stuff just like the old studio pros did. But his line delivery is old pro level. There's you know one way you've got because it's a fifties film you've got a, a, a woman verging on hysterics and he says there's no room for personal feelings in science, Judith. Oh, it's, totally! Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> it's absolutely. absolutely brilliant, but. Um, Neil himself had some thoughts on uh, on Brian Donlevy, and he does sound like an interesting character. It says, it says uh, during the 1940s, Donlevy had been a favourite of screwball comedy maestro Preston Sturgis, as well as a familiar face from many a film noir. By 1955, though, those days were well behind him. He'd always played the same sort of bullying part, Neil recalls. The town mayor or something in the Wild West, some crooked creature... He could be quite funny, and he played those things perfectly well. Sturgis, of course, kept him rigidly to style, and he did what he was told to do. They were fine. But he had become a Hollywood drunk, waiting for death as he sunk down enormous quantities of martini. <laughs> and he, he has a, a similar opinion on him in Quatermass 2, the, um, the one with the monsters in domes. And he says, basically, he was just spent the entire movie at the bottom of a bottle of gin. Yes, and right. It doesn't detract from it because Crater Mass it, it 2 doesn't. is a great film. It is. And I mean, and it's worth talking about the plot of that. You've got, you know, strange meteorites dropping on the English countryside in Crater Mass 2, the enemy from space. They emit an alien infection that takes over humans. And there's this new industrial estate working at a top secret factory. And it's a little, they sort of find out that actually you know, the aliens have taken over that factory and then there's this sort of new, there's this village of workers who just want to keep their jobs, but when, when the aliens start threatening them, there's this absolutely bizarre, batshit crazy sequence where the villagers and Quatermass storm the factory. Yeah, it's and sort of ha- it's, it's quite, a, it's, it's just like, it's actually like a Frankenstein film. It's all they needed yeah. was, to- was tortures. And I mean, both those films... A great, and it's, a, it's interesting to figure later on if we can refer that to, in its inverse to Quatermass 1979. They've got a very much a, a sort of, they're all about secrecy, the nuclear mm. state. There are no cause for alarm here. Everyone, you haven't seen anything, you know, the British military, and this includes, you know, Quatermass and the, and the pit is similar to the, the authorities are always trying to cover something up. You know, there's no cause for concern. It's, got, it's all this nuclear anxiety and it's also, I mean, you know, thinking about the British nuclear program, which was founded, I think, in 1947 by the, mm. by the Labor Party, Clement Attlee, the Prime Minister Attlee. And, um, yeah, it's, 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 I love the way they tackle that sort of zeitgeist of all that security and that paranoia. And, mm. and, and it's interesting that... Um, I didn't. I was reading in one of the one of the things I, re, I read for this that there was actually in the press in the nineteen fifties, Quatermass like was a descriptor used in the press in the nineteen fifties to describe government owned run secret installations. Ah, so there's so, so there you go. So it was so embedded. Yes, in, in it, the was, it was so big. It was so big. Yeah. It was so these films were huge, and I presume the TV shows, which I didn't watch, were huge as well. Yeah, there were, and you know, sadly, the the first serial was broadcast live, so there are no. I don't think there are any recordings left of a lot of it. But the second serial, you can still watch. I think you can even watch it on YouTube, and the the Quatermass and the Pit, Pit serial is still widely available, so that's watchable. But yeah, they they were like phenomenon. Mm, you know, mm. there were cultural touchstones of television when there were mm. only. Mm. Two television channels, and one of them was part time or something. You know, I can't remember. I went live in the fifties, but yeah, they were absolutely huge. But th- that scene where the storm that storm the the industrial facility. One of the things I really loved about the first film, and I'm it's going to annoy me now because I'm going to forget his name. But the police inspector was played by a really um, well known British actor, famous for playing Dixon or Doc Green on screen. So it was, it was like the, the first television beat copper type serial. And the second film is played by another guy who isn't as it doesn't have much presence but it is the same the same police inspector character but when the storm in the gates there's that wonder there's a wonderful bit and phil said is that the inspector on the top of that car 
and we had to rewind it and watch it again. So when they're all storming the gates, the old elderly police inspector is on top of a car swinging a rifle and battering the shit out of security guards. I know, I know, I know. They, they, just, they really go for it. They, 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 transfer, yeah. they transform from this group of meek, mild, intimidated villagers who just want to keep their jobs in this unbeknownst to them alien-run factory mm. to this absolute group of whirling dervishes who literally storm in them seize machine guns and engage in this running battle with the security guards who are, of course, taken over by, you know, sort of alien beings in human, yeah. human guise. Yes, they really, they really go for it. It's, the, uh, it's, the, um, it's that sort of fury under, underneath that sort of suburban calm, isn't it? Yeah. And also what, what's kind of implicit in it that is easy to forget now, and, and, and I think it's driven home when you watch it now, if you recognise character actors from British black and white war movies, is there is there's an actor in there. He's one of the few townspeople, apart from like you know the mayor or whoever it is, who actually get lines. And I think he plays it with an Irish accent, but he wasn't an Irish actor. But that guy was in dozens and dozens and dozens of war movies in bit parts as as Tommy's. So you get this kind of implicit sense that these guys who, who work in this town, all these workmen, they're probably all World War Two veterans. So when it actually takes time when it's time to take up arms and take on these security guards they're all perfectly capable and handy of doing it so i think that kind of aids the verisimilitude of watching all these workmen going from what is essentially the what is it a whist drive <laughs> when when quatermass first goes into that housing estate the the little community center it says whist drive 7 p.m so they've gone from the whist drive to taking up arms and having a mass battle and most of them getting killed at the factory where they work it's it's just wonderful I'm pretty sure that that actor is a chap called Percy Hubert, and Percy Hubert actually was an Australian actor who went over oh. to who went over to England. And yes, he was in so much stuff. And I remembered him. He's he's in. I'm pretty sure he was Australian. I don't know, one of your viewers might. Oh no, no, I'm wrong. Sorry, he is. He was born in the UK. I think he spent some time in Australia. But it's Percy Hubert, and I remember him playing one of the prisoners in Bridge on the River Kwai. He plays yes. one. Of, he plays one of the prisoners that gets kitted up as a woman, and they do, they do a drag sort of show to buck up the morale and bridge on the River Kwai, as yeah. you do. That's right. And also, he was in the Wild Geese. Um, so the Wild Geese got all you know. You had Richard Burton and oh my god, Roger we're really Moore going and... off into some tangents here. Yeah. And oh don't, yeah. Don't but, start me on the Wild Geese. But just about every character actor who played one of the mercenaries in that film were handpicked. Because they'd been, they were so visibly recognisable as guys yeah. who'd been in all those films. Yeah. And Percy Herbert was in The Wild Geese as well. That's and right. He's, That's he's, right. I, I can always visualise his death because I think he's one of the ones who gets shot in the berry just there and you get a little dribble of blood <laughs> down his forehead as he, as he goes down. Oh, my God, yeah. that, show, that show, The Wild Geese. Yes, look, we, can really get, we can really go down a Wild Geese rabbit hole. I those have got those, a those deep, old deep guys. Love. Oh, me too. My, my father yeah. took me to the films back when I was really young and Dad was still alive. I remember it was it was one – I'm sure it was a surprise one night. He said, come on, get your – it's a school night. Get your, get your coat. We're just – we're going out. I didn't know what we were doing. And it was Dad taking me into the city to see the wild geese, which yeah. I just absolutely thought was extraordinary. And I still do. So, I've watched it to this or day, times since. To this very day, the very final – not the final scene, but the final part in Africa yeah, where yeah, Richard yeah. Harris is injured and running after the film and he shouts, kill me. Yeah. And Richard Burton's going, I can't. And then he ends up shooting him with a submachine gun. Richard Burton, this cl wonderful, wonderful actor who knows what he's in, he knows what film he's in. He's weeping. <laughs> he's weeping tears as he has to gun down his best friend. You sure and I up? always... I, well, it probably is. It's the alcohol, the alcohol the sweat, sweats, you know, <laughs> sweat, <that's... laughs> sweat out of his body. Yeah, but yeah. the acting performance is so tremendous yeah, yeah, yeah. that um, whenever I watch that and he goes, I can't, I choke up watching it. <laughs> like a fucking idiot. No Rafer Johnson, oh, no job. Yes, that's yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's I, great, great, great show. Absolutely love that film. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> we could do a whole, a whole episode on, on the on... Euston Films mercenary and SAS yes, movies. Yes, Let's yes. quickly get back to where yeah, we started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We also watched, of course, we, we loved Brandon. One last note on Quatermass 2, though. It's really, really unique for a film where you can see Sid James getting machine gunned. <laughs> but he, he plays the tabloid journalist, doesn't he? That, he does, that, yeah. That, that Bernard Quatermass 
uh, teams up with to explore the alien control factory. And, of course, the aliens yeah. have spread to Whitehall, so they're trying. It's a sort of conspiracy. Yeah. And, again, that that show, it picked, I mean, as Neil did, and, God, you could you can't do justice to his work in one show, but that that show, picked, that film picked up on so many little things that are going on. I mean, there's a poster in that film, in, in the in the back, on one of the walls in that film, remember, secrets mean sealed lips. Mm. So it's all about secrecy and it's all about the, the fight around this nuclear state and the secrecy of the nuclear state, Cold War propaganda. Um, it, there's these new industrial states that are starting to pop up in the 1950s in the UK and, of course, mm. you know, in Australia as well. So there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff going on in that film, and as, as well as some a nice nod back to I always think a nice nod back to the um, yeah to the villagers storming storming Frankenstein's castle or any any bad guy's castle with their flaming torches. You know they've had yeah. enough. Yeah, yeah. The, there there are a couple of really wonderful moments in that as well, and one of them is I think a little bit more horrific in the serial, but it still works in the Hammer movie. And it's when, of course, they're holed up. They're, they're under siege in that control centre. And Quatermass decides, right, we're going to adjust the gas feed to these enormous domes that have got the alien creatures in. And a couple of them, someone on a tannoy is saying, come out, we'll treat you well, and all this business. And a couple of them, like the more weak-willed ones, say, no, we've, we've, we've got to go, we've got to go out, we, we can't stay, we're just going to die. So they end up going out. And five minutes later, they realise that they've been stuffed into a pipe. <laughs> To block up the oxygen feed, and their blood is leaking. Oh <laughs> their blood God. is leaking that, that's from the pipes. Pretty amazing. That's it's pretty amazing. incredible. It's absolutely incredible. It's, and because it's in black and white, it's not really gory or explicit, but it's just like it's so cold and horrific. Ah, it's wonderful. And as I said, that that was like the template for so many John Pertwee Doctor Who's. It's fantastic. And then, of course, we watched Quatermass in the Pit. Fantastic and, film. Incidentally, just we'll we'll lead off with Nigel Neal's summation of Andrew Keir as Quatermass. He said Andrew Keir was fine. <laughs> Full stop. Yeah, look, but he he also I mean he also bagged out. I mean, let's let's be frank that Neil also bagged out John Mills as Quatermass. Didn't like him either. And yeah. I thought, I mean, we're jumping ahead. I thought Mills was excellent in the nineteen seventy nine Quake. Yeah. but yes, I'm sure he didn't really like it. Did, did you like Don Levy? Um, it, I, I think he's, he's fine with Don Levy just saying he was hard bitten and he was a drunk, yeah, but right. you know he played a man, he played man of action Quatermass. His yeah. hardest, and again we're jumping ahead a little bit, his hardest on Simon McCorkindale. Yes, he is yes. brutal about Simon McCorkindale. The, the, the astronomer <laughs> in the nineteen seventy nine Quatermass. Yeah, I yeah. think that, I think um, the, the most fascinating thing to me in I mean Quatermass and the Pit is the whole idea. So it comes out. In '67, and of course, mm. 2001, A Space Odyssey comes out in '68. But you've got to think mm. it's almost like one's influenced from the other because part of what's going on in Quatermass is in the pit is they're digging up an old tube station. They they find this alien saucer or this alien craft, and they actually find one of the aliens who's silhouetted, kind of looks like the devil. So mm. there's this whole intonation that so much of what so much of, of folklore and the occult and Satanism in, our, in, 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 in primitive culture comes from the, actually is these aliens. Mm. But there's also this sort of very strong nod. In fact, I think they say it at one point in the film of, about how the aliens gave humans an evolutionary, an evolutionary leg up, mm. which is exactly, mm. of course, what happens in um, 2001 A Space Odyssey. So I don't know mm. whether there's any kind of, I don't know whether Kubrick, Kubrick pinched anything or, or should I say, um, Arthur C. Clarke pinched anything. Probably not, actually. I think the Arthur C. Clarke book was much earlier. But just an interesting little thing that's obviously going through the culture at that stage, aliens visiting primitive Earth and, and leaving their technology here in the form of, of, you know, stones or structures that we don't know how they got built and maybe and having another having other influences on sort of human evolution which of course is what that whole Eric von Danaher craze was about mm. in the 1970s the book that oh, was yeah. on chariot of the gods the book that was on the shelves of absolutely every single parent i think every single bookshelf in yeah. any house i ever went into when i was young including my my own parents my mm. you know my dad was an old conservative military veteran and my mother liked um 
you know, reading romance and uh, stuff, stuff, you know, uh, with the guy who, who the guy who did the salacious pot boilers. But they both read, um, they both read Chariot of the Gods. Yeah, I recently got Chariots of the Gods and uh, two others that he wrote in a slipcase set from a charity shop in Cleethorpes for like two quid. And I've got them on the shelf and I keep meaning to revisit them because I read Chariots of the Gods when I was a kid. And of course, that's got all the planes of Nazca stuff in it, which I think, you know, it, it, Graham Hancock's kind of leapt on a lot of this type of stuff in, in later years. But yeah, th- those books, especially for a stoned teenagers as well as adults and people in the 60s and 70s were like, whoa, this is mind blowing. But interestingly, Quated Mass and the Pit, the serial, was broadcast in 1958 and 59. That's right, that's so, right. So, so it predates Arthur C. Oh. Arthur C. Clarke's um, short story about the monolith on the moon, I think by a couple of years. So Neil always had his finger on the pulse of this yep, stuff. Yep, yep, absolutely. And, it, and even now with films like you know Prometheus, they're all still, I mean, I say now, Prometheus is like, is that 10 years old now probably? Not quite, but um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, so even be. stuff like Prometheus is following up on the same themes. Because it's eternally fascinating, isn't it? You know, where the things here before us and where did we come from and everything else. What I really love about Quatermass and the Pit is that it brings in that, it does have that classic horror angle. And you do have, you know, with the Hobbs Lane stuff, you know, the fact that the the malign influence of the, like, psychological um, spread of these creatures, even though they've been in this you know, this hidden away in this pot, this pod, this ship underground. It's had this malign influence on the area to the point where the street was called Hobbs Lane and there were people having visions of strange creatures hopping over walls. Like, spring Eel Jack is never mentioned in it, but basically it's like a spring Eel Jack kind of scenario where people are seeing the devil. And once they're freed, you have the ravening mob again, which uh, seems to be a nice theme in some of these Quatermass stories. But when we were watching it, it was it was interesting because Phil was really disappointed with Andrew Keir as Quatermass, and you know I thought it was okay. I, I liked the fact he was a little bit more patronly and accessible. But there's the bit where the influence of the alien creatures is spreading across that part of London, and there are now mobs of people rampaging through the streets, and houses are on fire, and Quatermass himself gets affected by it, and it's his scientist. Um, colleague who doesn't get affected who kind of pulls him back from the brink and Phil said something along the lines of there's no way arsey black and white Quatermass would have been that weak minded <laughs> bring back Brian Don Levy <laughs> there's a couple of things there because I think that's, that's, that's quite true I mean he's softening by Quatermass in the pit because yeah. he's got he's got that arch- so he's, it's that conflict between the military and the archaeologists and the archaeologists mm. are going hang on a second this is Something's going on here, and it's something quite ancient, and it's something we've got to try and understand. Whereas the military just go, no, 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 nothing to see here. It's all se- it's a state, it's a military secret. We're we're just going to put this story out that it's a secret weapon from the Blitz era that we've sort of unearthed in this London tube station, and we, it's too dangerous. If word gets out, it's just going to be panic. And so, and Quatermass is sort of pulled between these two, between the sort of military. Of course, and he's in a conflict with the military because the military are trying to pull his rocket program mm. under the Ministry of Defence and make it not independent and bring it in as a sort of arm of Britain's sort of Cold War defence capability. And he's attracted to the archaeologists who are learned and trying to understand what's going on. Of course, this is the first. So you've got James Donald as Dr. Rowan. And James Donald was also in... Bridge on the River Kwai, of course. We just got mm. a, a nod to that. He's the one at the very end that says, "Madness, madness," <laughs> yeah. when the when the bridge blows up. But Doctor Roney, he plays the archaeologist Doctor Roney, and of course, he's a female. There's a prominent female role mm. played by Barbara Shelley, and Barbara's mm. one of the one of the archaeologists who sort of wants mm. to know what's sort of going on. And then you've got Julian Glover, who I forever now see as the bad guy in the first Indiana Jones film. He's playing yeah. the sort of he's playing the sort of spit and polish British military guy who just wants the whole thing to be kept under wraps. Yeah, Julian Glover is one of those actors who was everywhere 
Yeah, 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 yeah. He yeah. was, you know, for me as a kid growing up, he was Scaroth of the Jaggeroth in City of Death in the Tom Baker Doctor Who serial. He was um, General Veers, you know, he was General Veers in The Empire Strikes Back. He yeah, got yeah, absolutely yeah. everywhere. I've got Cosses in the Indiana Jones film, but I think he's great in this. If you want someone to play an officer with a stick up their ass, mm. Julian Glover is a fucking great choice. You know? And the other the other aspect of uh, Quatermass at the pit, which is interesting, and and I don't consider myself by any stretch of the imagination an expert on Neil's work. I've seen mm. quite a bit of it, but I don't consider myself an expert on it. And I've read a bit about it, but obviously that ho- he he did have that theme recurring through quite a lot of his work. It occur- it, occur- it occurs in the nineteen seventy nine Quatermass um film and it's also in things like the stone tape i think it's the stone tape yep. not the stone yep. tapes where the rock the uh, you know, old things rocks hmm. buildings um you know um old stone formations they can hold memories they can hold yep. things they can they can exert a power that you know that 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 continues even though just to to the to the outside they're just bits of stone hmm. You know, but there's there's something going on here, and something much older, and something we really just don't understand at all, and really probably best that we just leave it the hell alone in some respects because it's incredibly dangerous too. Yeah, that's one of the great things about Neil's work, isn't it? He, yeah, he he comes up with really really interesting approaches and ideas to essentially things that are unknown, things that are difficult to solve, and it's always satisfying the stuff that he comes up with. I think in the Stone Tape, just the very idea that you know, ghostly manifestations are actually emanating from certain combinations of minerals and not only minerals, but kind of just specific almost accidents of chemistry and location and that actually produce these manifestations and are literally terrifying to people is it's just a fantastic idea. The fact that the world around us is aware of our presence in a way that we just don't understand. It's great. It's just a great well, the, idea. The stone tapes, nineteen seventy two. Isn't that that's that's the stones in a cellar of a haunted building yeah. act as a conduit for sort of dark forces and also hauntings and memories and 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 of the people who've been in that cellar who've been haunted, but it goes back even further to yeah. some sort of much more ancient sort of being. And of course it's still science fiction. I mean, in some respect, Neil was quite brilliant in some of the things, but he was still a bit of a sci-fi hack because hmm. he, he's got a machine that can read that. You know, he's got a machine that can read and record the stones, just like in Quite a Mass in the Pit, they've developed this machine. It might have been the archaeologist who developed it. I can't remember. There's a machine they can develop that can read brains. Yeah. So they can pop it on the the, 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 the sort of, carcass of the the ancient carcass of the alien they find in the spaceship and it's able to read what's the sort of what's in the alien's mind from eons ago which of course Mm. makes absolutely no sense at all but it's really good (laughs) yeah i mean at the end of the day it's it's still a it's it's still tv entertainment isn't it that's right that's right and and it's it's probably um in this stuff uh, you know I, i suppose the the british tv audience in the 50s and 60s you know, there's a certain level of sophistication level that you aim for, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, oh, and they're quite look. 1979 Quatermass is a very complex, very sophisticated piece of television. I mean, obviously so because the BBC pulled the plug on it and just said, "Sorry, this is far too yeah. complex for us to do." And then it went to ITV, which is supposedly the uh, the more commercial of the TV networks in Britain at that time. So yeah, yeah it's quite complex. 19, mm. The 1979 one is very complex. A lot going on there. Well, I think that's probably a good time. We've been at yeah. it 45 minutes. We haven't even got to it yet. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> no, we had to, set, we had to set the stage. We had to it's set me who the brought stage. up the wild geese. <laughs> <laughs> no, look, don't, don't. Mercenaries in film are one of, is one of my favourite sort of, you know, cultural preoccupations, you know. <laughs> oh, God. There's an entire podcast series on yep. that alone, isn't there? Uh, which reminds me, I have been reading to meaning to reread and rewatch the Dogs of War, but let's not go down that. Anyway, Quatermass. So the serial. Careful, careful, careful. Yeah, it could go. It could go anywhere. Right, I'm just gonna have a. I'm, now, of course, it's a, a balmy evening, and you've already told me it's 39 degrees over there in Australia. It is, and I can see that you're having a, a rather delicious looking tipple. What are you having? I'm having a uh, finishing off a bottle of Tullymore Duke. 
Irish mm. whiskey that I got for Christmas. Mm. It's very nice. On the other hand, it's ten. Well, it's eighteen minutes past ten in the morning on a rainy, miserable day in Bradford here, and I've had a lem sip because I'm full of snot. And I'm drinking a can of Vimto, so that's what is that? What's what's Vimto? Is that sounds like something out of a Quatermass film? Yeah, weirdly, this is the second time in a couple of episodes we've ended up talking about strange British regional pops that don't really don't really have any kind of presence outside the UK. I think it was Iron Brew. That still happens. I'm glad that still happens. It was Iron Brew a couple of episodes ago. Okay. Vimto is it's a sparkling fruit flavor pop which has raspberry, grape, and blackcurrant in it. And um, when I was a kid, Vimto came... It was a cordial. It wasn't a soft drink. It was a cordial that came in a glass bottle that always had, like, a a plastic wrapper around the top half of the bottle in a way that you don't really see it, like, crinkled plastic wrapper around the top half of the bottle. You don't really see that type of thing anymore. But, yeah, this is weird. Upcoming episode, Miles is on, and he's, as a result of that Iron Brew discussion, he, he brings a regional... Um, Wisconsin pop to the table. So oh, there you go. We're branching off into different areas. Re- strange state drinks. Yeah, so I'm on Vinto. But anyway, Quatermass. Who was it who actually produced this variety? Houston, was it Houston, Houston Films? Films? It was Houston, Houston Films. Films. Oh, yeah. my God. Another connection to the wild geese and who dares wins. Absolutely, absolutely, Ooh, absolutely. Dear, dear. But as a result, it looks fantastic. It's filmed on film. Mm. It's gritty. It's got a beautiful filmic look. But it it really kicks off, doesn't it? With you, you said earlier on that Quatermass actually goes through an arc through these four mm, stories. That's right. And by this right. story, he, in a way, the point you made works better when you consider the Brian Don Levy Quatermass rather yeah, than the TV absolutely. serial Quatermass, because he's so driven to be you know the British Rocket Group's absolute rod to make sure that all this stuff happens at the expense of almost everything else, including women's fragile emotions, we should point out. But now we start off with a very, very different Quatermass who turns up to a TV studio in a ravaged London, which is straight out of an NEL Britain is fucked novel, and I love it. Tell us about the Quatermass at the start of this one. Well, it's it's basically let's have a think. Yes, it's it's great, I think, and it's both. So Bernard Quatermass is dropped off in the middle of a barricaded London street. There's gunfire, there's sirens, the buildings on fire, and he's in, he's mugged by this vicious youth gang, and he's saved by Joe Cap, um, who's an astronomer. That's Simon McCorkendale. And it turns out that they're both on the way to sort of London's last remaining television studio to record a a sort of piece to camera, a live piece to camera to commemorate um, a sort of joint Russian-American space probe that's going on. I mean, you know, the docking docking of a Russian, of a Soviet, because, of course, it's still the Cold War, a Soviet and an American ship. And they get into the studio. I mean, it's, it's great. And there's this... So Quartermass in his sort of ship brown brown suit, which he wears for most of the film. And, you know, when Joe saves him from this group called the Barters, who were the bar, you know, named after the Barter mine off, and Quartermass says, they were enjoying it. They were enjoying <laughs> yeah. hurting me. What's going on? And they get to the television station. You know, it's, it's, all, it's all very agitprop. You can tell that there's no money. It's all sort of that the, the set has sort of been, you know, almost glued together. The host is there. Cap's on. Cap's there. Uh, Quatermass is there. They've got a live feed to this American scientist. The producer, the, the sort of host, turns to Quatermass and says, "You're the British of the far. You're the father of the British space rocket program. What do you think about this? You must be enormously proud." And he said, "Look, I think this is disgusting. It's a he says a, a, a symbolic wedding between a corrupt democracy and a monstrous tyranny." And he just gets out this photograph. And he says, "All I want to do is I want to find this person." And it's a picture of a of a young girl, it's Hattie, played by Rebecca S-A-I-R, Sayer, Rebecca Sayer, who's his granddaughter, who's lost and he wants to find her. And he's this dishevelled, quite traumatised, I think, broken old man. He doesn't care about any of this space stuff and he just wants to find his granddaughter and, of course, there's a, there's a malfunction in the, the space probe and it, it blows up and all kinds of things go from that. But at the first 20 minutes of that... Are just a really, a really good scene set up. Mm. Quatermass, the broken man. London, Britain is broken. It's all falling apart. He's falling apart. 
Yeah. Well, that, that London is broken stuff is wonderful, and it's great in the book as well. I'm going to read yeah, it. Yes, so I believe I believe it's better in the book. I hear there's it, a lot. It, it, I believe there's a lot more in the book about London. You know the the dishevelled London the barricades, the the pay cops, the mercenary the pay, police. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, there's um, no fuel. There's a barter economy. They're burning books for war- warmth. There's yeah superstitions. There's just there's gladiatorial matches in 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 Wembley Arena. There's just random snipers. It's just you know. Yeah. So after after they leave the TV station and they're in Joe Cap's armored vehicle because he's got like a, a a bespoke armored Land Rover and they they shoo off a couple of girls who are trying to break into the Land Rover and Joe Cap says girls can be the worst. But uh, it's in the book it says uh, blue brigades said Cap. Haven't you come across them? The bad as natural enemies. Vigilantes? Cap snorted. They're even worse. They shoot children to prove it. Some streets were still lined with cars, but for the heavy curtain of grime on them and the rust breaking through everywhere on the bodies, they might have been waiting for their owners to jump in and drive off. They wouldn't go now, said Cap, even if you filled them up. All that carefully fashioned metal, the bitter labour disputes that had been fought over the fashion of it in another age. Remember the oil? What oil, said Cap? The oil from under the North Sea that was going to make us rich and put everything right for us. I've got to say, just coming away from the reading a bit, that stings. <laughs> That's a lot that fucking stings. <laughs> Cap swung the heavy wagon around another corner. Strong wrists, Quatermass had noticed. You could take a chance on being an intellectual, but you had to be toughened up. Oil and water don't mix, said Cap. Who said that? They mix all right when you smash the pipelines. The gangs proved it. What's that ahead? Smoke or gas. A white cloud belching at the far end of the street. Quatermass instinctively covered his face, but as they got nearer, he saw people moving about in it unperturbed. Flower, said Cap. They're looters. Men and women dragging sacks out through the smashed windows of a food dispensary and heaving them up on their shoulders. As the wagon passed them, it was the target of instant abuse. The looters yelled and shook their fists. The dog growled fiercely. Quiet, pup, said Cap. They think we're cops. Anything with petrol in it. Watch out when we hit the barter market. They drove right through it. It was like a scene from Central America or in Africa. An upcountry village market. Marshall had been right in his sneer about joining the Third World. Even at this early hour, goods were being laid out. Sale or barter, prized possessions brought in the hope of a swap for food to keep alive. Frightened faces turned to them. Cap slowed down, picking his way between the ground carpets and the rickety stalls. Now they're among the pros. A cat fur seller, clad in his wares, screaming his slogan, Genuine cat skin! Put it on your chest! A medicine man waving coloured bottles. When your kids catch the cough, you'll bless my name to have this stuff. A charm stall with its grisly exhibit. A mummified corpse in a leather jacket and a German helmet with a bullet hole in it. The charm seller screeched, Hell's Angels, they called him. This one was gut sucker, killed in the Battle of Catterick Kemp, and his power has never left him. Every envelope carries the magic of the gut sucker, never known to fail. It's just fucking brilliant. It's brilliant. That's great. That's great. And it's good in the serial. That bit's good in the serial as well. Yeah, you know, right. they, they actually do reproduce that in the serial. And you've and you've got a guy selling books, and the sign says, "Books for burning." They burn you well. Know. They burn yeah. well. These books burn brilliantly. What one thing that kind of took me out of it a little bit is when when Neil gets attacked. Sorry, not when Neil. When Quatermass gets attacked by the two guys before he gets into the TV studio, they have fucking terrible wigs. And their accents are really posh. <laughs> they're yeah, well, obviously like mean, really middle class actors with bad wigs on. Yeah, Freudian slip on your part, Neil. But I mean, this runs through this one of the many things. I mean, Neil was no fan of the camp culture. No, and and arguably of young of the impact of the permissive society, the counterculture, everything that was going on on the young, what the young had become, and you really sort of see this because then. You know that the cat takes Quatermass to this satellite station, which he's sort of still got work, is, is still functioning, and it's um, as we as I I was thinking, it's Chekhov's satellite, as in you know Chekhov's gun. We'll see that we'll see that satellite being used later, and it's he's got his family, his two girls, and they that the satellite station is near Ringstone Round, near these old monoliths mm. in a circle, a sort of like a, a poor person's Stonehenge, I suppose, called Ringstone yeah. Round, and we get introduced to this weird cult called the planet people yeah and we find who are these sort of i suppose anti-technology young people who believe that they're going to be transported to a better life on another planet and i don't think it's any massive spoiler i'm going to spoil the whole thing right anyway very early on there we see hattie yeah quater granddaughter 
with the planet people. Yeah. And I had that earworm in my head for days after watching that lay, 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 as they walk around with little sort of planets going lay, lay, creepy as fuck. Yeah, they're referred to as plum bobs in the yeah. novel. That's so right, there's, right. Oh, oh, there's, so they're following it like, uh, like you know, proper hippie stuff, and I think the way the way this TV series is set up, I think before we go on, it's it's worth mentioning that this is right in the middle of a sweet spot of British almost apocalyptic TV that was really super popular. Not not only an adult drama, but that that whole NEL Britain is fucked novel. It, it was on TV as well. There was a wave of it on TV. Yeah. Absolutely. So you've got you've got the Guardians, you've got nineteen ninety Survivor. is Survivors, yeah. Day of the Triffids. Yep. And even even Kids TV was in on the act with um, Noah's Castle. Lots of stuff. This was a real. I know this was the same in Australia, and and in the US. I mean, it was it was really something that was you know the counterculture had basically soured by this stage as a radical force, but you know its reverberations went. Right through, you know, you had the the People's Temple, French, you know, Jonestown. You had other sort of cult disasters going on. Hmm. It was all, go- it was very much coursing through the culture at the time. Absolutely. Yeah. 1979, you, you, you elected your own apocalypse, Margaret Thatcher. Uh, yeah, very true. And, and yeah, interestingly, because this is 1979 as well, a lot of those other ones we've referred to and a lot of the other post-apocalyptic fiction, there's a... We generally tend to think of a lot of post-apocalyptic fiction these days as, as like you know arising from um, corporations or right-wing governments or you know dystopias or anything else. But there was there was a, a lot in the seventies that was the opposite way around. So the, the series nineteen ninety, for example, with Edward Woodward, that was very much a left-wing government that had become totalitarian and got out of control. The interesting yeah. thing about this one is this is quite politically agnostic. Yes, you know, is. this is this it's it's cynical and it's grim, but it's quite agnostic. There's no reference, unlike some of those others, to the political slant of the government that's presiding over the collapse. Even when the prime minister is is in scenes later on, you don't really get a sense of what political persuasion they come from. It's just he's definitely the way he's described in the book and the way he's presented in, in the serial is of the political class. So you've got all this wonderful stuff, this intriguing start, all the terrific opening, boarded up terraces, rubbish in the streets. You know, it's really intriguing to have a starting point for a serial as the Quatermass story starting in this already speculatively fucked country. And you've got this really fascinating plot with the youth being drawn for some reason to these monolithic sites. And it's a fantastic setup. It's brilliant. And and an anti-technology Quatermass, who is the antithesis of the Quatermass all throughout the series. He's now... No, I don't want a part of this. This is corrupt. It's I don't want any part of it. Yeah, and I think it's down to the script, but I think the direction's pretty good because, of course, it's directed by Piers Haggard, who I, I don't think he course. was never did a million films, but he did one of my favourites, Blood on Satan's Claw. Blood on Satan's Claw. That's correct. He, he also did, did. What else did he do? Oh, correct. You know, directed directed episodes of the most dystopian spy series ever, Callum. Ah, of course. Yeah. So. Everything about the way this is set up, everything about the way it is shot is great. So the TV studio scene, it's packed with detail and character. Mm. The charts on the walls showing the power cut rotors. Yeah. Oh, um, absolutely, yes. Signs about energy misuse fines. The brilliant makeup lady smoking a fag while she's doing Quatermass's right. makeup, trying to patch That's him right. up. And yeah, the producer you'll, look all, says, you'll look all right, love. You patch, yeah, up, the produ- you patch up people like this often? Worse. Yeah. The producer oh. goes, um, where's makeup? Where is that old slag? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> and, she, and she comes out in her house coat with a fag fag That's dangling right. from her bottom lip. It's wonderful. And then as we go we go through that market, the, the, I've just read the bit in the book where you get the detail. The Queen's already dead in this world because we've got graffiti plastered on walls saying kill HM the King all over the place. There are ni- all those other nice bits of details. You've got the you've got selling cat skins you've got the bookstall with sign saying guaranteed to burn well and you've got the the hell's angel corpse almost like a a, a, totem. a medieval totem. A, a new english library totem the other yeah. thing that you've got we we get introduced to in series 1 or episode 1 of the series is of course the monoliths mm. and 
at this again another earworm. I just work huffety puffety ringstone round. If you lose your hat, it can never be found. So pull up your breeches right up to your chin and fasten your cloak with a bright new pin. And when you are ready, then we can begin huffety puffety huffety puffety puff, which is much more scary when it's recited by Joe Capps to teenage to two young daughters and then so why are the young people why are the planet people coming to the you know the the, the monoliths mm. and and Ber- and joe cap's wife who is uh clara cap barbara kellerman bernard said kurt quotemass says at one point yeah it's curious about nursery rhymes what else they might be saying and claire cap responds yes about plague or politics so he's also yeah. setting up this sort of um of course, he's, he's, he's folk horror, what's in the stone circles, what's going on underneath the ground, why do the planet people keep coming to these stone circles? Mm. Well, we find out at the end of episode one, don't we? We it's, do uh, indeed. It's a, it's a little bit terrifying, but let, let's talk a little bit about the, um, the site, what Joe Cap has got is, it's a really terrific set because all that was built. None of that was was real. So those huge dishes, the rails that they sit on, it was all built for the cereal, and it looks fantastic. It looks super convincing. So they obviously had a few quid to spend yeah. on this cereal, and I think all oh, that's great. I think there's a potential weak link for it in a way for me. But again, this is me coming at coming at it from having been introduced to it via the book, which is inevitable. I think when you read a book and and compare it to something which is an adaptation, we know that Nigel Neal was brutal in his description of Simon McCorkindale. Um, I won't read it out because it's actually quite mean what he says about Simon McCarkin. I don't think he's quite good in it. I don't, I don't see, I don't, you know. I, th- I think he's good, but I think him and Kellerman are a little bit overly theatrical. Mm. I think that they're they're acting like they're on the stage and even from the moment we meet his wife, she's almost on the verge of hysteria In a way, whereas in the book she's a lot more measured and controlled for the most part until she does start to feel some of this influence. Mm. And I think it's prob- more problematic because they're acting against the pretty subtle and understated John Mills, who, even though Mills apparently didn't want to do this and it was his wife who read the script and convinced him to do it, he seems to be taking a very understated approach to all of this. Not in a bad way. I think Which it's works. just part it of works. It, it works. It absolutely works because that's John Mills. And I think they're trying to act themselves through the screen. And that's slightly problematic. Mm. I suppose but so, yeah. I, th- I think if they just na- dialed it down a notch, you know, I think it would have worked a lot better because they must have been fucking exhausted after a day's acting with that level of intensity. But huh. on the on the other hand, I'm not living in fucked Britain, so maybe that's exactly how I would behave as well. That's right. Well, know, it's also knows. it's the world is falling apart around them, and you know they're yeah. worried about their kids and yeah. The other thing, I mean, just reading out that nursery, I went down this entire rabbit hole trying to figure out was that nursery rhyme actually nursery rhyme actually a real nursery rhyme, yeah. or did Neil make it up? Hmm. And of course, it was made up. Although yeah. if you if you go on to certain websites, you can see oh the person who found the desk in the old op shop and the nursery rhyme was carved into the old desk, so that much must mean that it pre predates the television series and all that. So there's a whole mythology around Neil's made-up nursery rhyme, which is quite terrifying, that whole nursery rhyme thing, I think. Yeah, and you don't think about these things when you're a kid, do you, when you sing Ring a Ring of Roses and no, all that right. stuff. You, right. know, you, have, you have no idea what the, the actual right. origins of these things are, and, and they the tend to be a way of you know, capturing and managing the absolute trauma <laughs> around real-world events and embedding them in you know, local kind of culture and, and the ways of managing Absolutely. children's expectations about about how all these things work. You know, I mean, Ring a Ring of Roses is, when you actually understand the meaning behind it, it's pretty fucking terrifying in, in, of itself. It's you know. curious about nursery rhymes, what else they might be saying. Mm. I think the other thing that the, the telly version, again, is slightly weaker on than the book is the planet people themselves. Because they tend to look a bit more like an Amdram cast of hair. And if they all burst out into a, a rendition of Age of Aquarius, it wouldn't really seem that out of place. In in the book, I think they're much more they're all they're all still obsessed, but they're grotty and malnourished. And despite their ministrations, super desperate, you know, under the surface. You do get you do get a sense of that a little bit further on when we haven't met him yet, but kick along. 
the the meanest and nastiest the Charles of the planet Manson people. Of the Charles Manson of the planet. People. That's right. Yeah, who's um, who in the serial is dressed like a gimp. Yeah, all oh, right. <laughs> Which is a bit bit odd. And but, looks like, and in the TV show looks like the guy who's saying, you know, sort of, you know, saying, "Prepare ye the way of the Lord" at the beginning of Godspell. Yes, you know, he's yeah. calling all those people, all those people out from their their normal lives to come and be baptized in the fountain in the middle of Central Park. Yeah, that's not right. an uncreepy yeah. show and it's a film in its own right in some respects. Yeah, yeah. yeah I suppose you, you could look at a guy like that dressed like that and think actually this guy is super fucking creepy. <laughs> well, except he's got the sterling. <laughs> yeah. It was yeah, he takes true. off one of the pay, a dead pay cop who, you know, gets killed yeah. in the first round of reaping. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Uh, I think the rest of the cast make up for it, though, and it's quite a, an ensemble because Cap's radio telescope crew is... Well, there's David Yip, well-known in the UK at the time for being the Chinese detective, but not yet, I don't think. I think he was the Chinese detective in the early 80s. And future Oscar winner Brenda Fricker, interestingly. Huh, what what yeah. did she win a, a, an Oscar for? My Left Foot. Oh, she was. Right. She played Daniel Day Lewis's mum in My Left Foot. Oh, there you yeah. go. So she went on that? to be an Oscar winner. The other guy is a guy called Bruce Percher, so I only really knew from playing the space pirate villain in the Tom Baker to- Doctor Who story, The Pirate Planet, which was written by Douglas Adams. Yeah, but you know, it's it's a good cast, and we get at the end of that episode to Ringstone Round, where everything goes terrible. We get introduced to um, Kick Along. He, as I say, is wearing sort of weird gimp leathers, including a cod piece and a choker. It makes him look like an extra from the Canon Gore movie, um, but otherwise the, the the Ringstone Round scene is great. I mean, I still got, I still have a question in my head: Why are the contract police already there guiding Ringstone Round? And I couldn't quite get my head around that. But you know, that's not something to be too worried about, I don't think. But when they get there, the contract police are at Ringstone Round, and we've already found that the contract police are essentially, for the most part, South African mercenaries. So the police force, the Metropolitan Police and all the local police forces have all pretty much gone to shit from lack of public investment, just like the hospitals have. So there is a minister who is responsible for hiring South African mercenaries to come in as contract police. There is a wonderful bit in the serial as well when they leave in London where a contract policeman flags them down, says in his thick South African accent, are you sure you want to drive through here, the snipers? And they say, no, we're going through. And about two seconds later, one of them gets shot in the face by a sniper. Which is well, the other thing, the other really thing, really fantastic. Think, yeah, I mean, I think the whole four episodes, and we've only done episode one now, but uh, it, it's a, it's a, it's flawed but fascinating the whole thing. Mm. But I mean, and Neil Levin's because there's another scene because what happens at at the end of series one is we get the first this light from space mm. comes down and basically, well, sort of disintegrates or harvests the protein from all the people at Ringstone Round. And then the whole thing is just covered, you know, and, and it's just covered in ash. Hmm. And of course, what's what we, we will get onto that more. But there's a scene, and, and what they find out is that all around, and I will get back to your pay cop thing in a moment, because all around the world, at various old archaeologically significant sites, young people are gathering, and they're all basically being turned into dust. Hmm. And what's what's happening, you know, is uh, well. In Brazil, thousands of young people obliterated without a trace all the time. And um, what's happening is that Quatermass, and this is why it's always a little bit sort of pulpy in its own way, because he just comes up, oh, yes, the aliens are feeding off the youngest human organisms. Hmm. And, the, and and they did this in old times when they put, sort of put beakers, these these old stone sites, these monoliths, these, is that what they're called, monoliths? Yeah. Yeah. Under the monoliths are sort of old beakers where, you know, old humans came and they were sort of basically harvested. The aliens are essentially harvesting the young of mm. Earth. But there is a scene later on where there's a massive harvesting at Wembley Stadium mm. where there's this lovely little interaction between one of the pay cops. I mean, they're contract cops in the book, are they? Because they're pay cops in the film. Yeah. I think it's, it's interchangeable in the book. Yeah. They're referred to pay cops where, and contract where this cops. Yeah. really brutal pay cop stumbles in after you know and, and and the sky is just yellow from all the sort of like flesh the, the particles of dusty flesh in the atmosphere yeah it's horrifying isn't it yeah, yeah and, actually... and the paycock takes his helmet off and he and Quatermass have this really serious you know the paycock goes what's going on i just don't understand this this is terrible mm. you know and, and they have this really very human exchange even though these guys are just mercenaries you know yeah. So the whole yeah. film is sort of littered with the whole series is littered with those little 
a size that make it quite human. Yeah, that, that's like a, a real um, set piece scene as well, isn't it? Because, I mean, again, we're, we're skipping ahead, but fuck it, don't matter. We spoil everything on this show anyway. But essentially, Quatermass has been with the Prime Minister, he's been with the Cabinet, and they've realised that Wembley is a problem because planet people are congregating at Wembley to the tune of about seventy or 80,000 people, and Quatermass is thinking, we've got to do something about this. Of course, when they get there... The Prime Minister's dickhead nephew, who's also a minister who's responsible for the pay cops, has the army turn around and try and kill Quatermass and Annie, who we get introduced to shortly, who's like a regional commissioner. And then Quatermass... Shortly after to get episode in... one. Yeah, we're jumping yeah. we're jumping around a bit, yes. Yeah, well, you know what? It's, I think I think if we painstakingly went through all four episodes, we'd absolutely. be here for four absolutely. hours, wouldn't we? That's right, that's yeah. right. But I think there's a couple of things I really want to touch on that in those in between episodes. But that scene at Wembley Stadium is absolutely terrific when he comes out covered in ash and and grit and um, umska from narrowly avoiding being burnt himself. And that on conversation his, in with his paper, brown suit, he's still got his, his brown suit on. That's right. Yeah, it's fantastic. <laughs> it's fantastic. And that's it's really tragic as well because there's some stuff in the book about Annie that isn't in the series. So let's just we'll skip back again. So of course, okay. Ringstone Round has been decimated by this sky beam. This kick along guy, this nasty, unpleasant, evil planet Homicide. person, the Homicide. Charles Manson. Yeah. yeah. The, the, there are additional bits in the book about that as well. I think I can't remember if it's him or one of his colleagues who, who pulls the baby off one of the other planet people and just throws it to the floor. And she has to move on without the child. It's really grim. It's really brutal. She's played by Toya Wilcox yes, in the series, yes. which is interesting because, of course, we get a bit where the, after they've left Ringstone Round, they come across a farmhouse with a guy with a shotgun who's saying, you know, go away, leave us alone. And they generally behave like nasty raiders from a Mad Max movie at this point. They're thoroughly unpleasant. So there's this level of villainy involved. But back at the radio telescope, the planet people have come across the scene and Joe Cap is telling them to fuck off. They're firing shots in the air to try and get rid of them. But we get this point where his wife is becoming increasingly sympathetic to the planet people and she's, they're just children. And there's a sense that actually, we don't know how much younger she is than Joe Cap, but there's a sense that she is being pulled a little bit into some level of sympathy, not only for them as children, but also we have the, the bit that you referred to earlier on with his two young children singing the nursery rhyme and the sense of panic that it engenders. But of course, the important thing is they found a survivor at Ringstone Round, a small girl who survived. In the book, it's quite explicit about how many body parts there are scattered around the fringes of the site. But they do, with the TV budget, they do go as far as they can with that. And you, you do get a, a sense of partially, almost partially half digested bodies in the mess of the ash. Oh, yeah. Cor up. Torsos and corpses and bits and yeah. pieces, yes. Yeah, it's it's pretty grim. And they take this child back and Cap's wife ends up being extremely matronly and wants to look after this girl. And this is when Annie, the regional commissioner, turns up who has like the patient permission and you know, she's she's got the warrant of the crown as the regional commissioner and she's friends with the caps and she, she ends up being quite a, a, a more she's an important character in the serial, but she's got a little bit more going on in the novel, which scenes that weren't filmed. So you, again, you've got this ensemble cast. I think episode two gets from A to B, gets to where it needs to be, at the point where Quatermass and Annie say that they've got to take the child to get her essentially analysed. They need to understand what's happened to her because her legs are fucked, they're going, they're crystallising in some it's way. terribly burnt and terribly... Yes. She almost got a sort of Doctor Who type growth. Yes. On her, it has she looks like you know, it looks like it looks like the makeup department of Doctor Who have done the burns on her. Yeah. So so they set off, and we get one of my favourite passages when they try and get to London, and you've got some lovely scenes of them. She's in her armoured Land Rover. They've got the child in the back. Actually, separating her from Mrs. Cap was quite difficult because she was um, she didn't want to let her go. And you get this wonderful procession down motorways where the past the past pay cops on horses that look like medieval knights with all of their like armour and the shields. It's really starting to look like a, a sort of a semi-technological but medieval version of England. It looks fantastic. It looks really, really terrific. But then they get into London and hit a roadblock and essentially drive right into the middle of gang warfare 
with between the Barters and the Blue Coats. And yes, the Blue Brigade. Yeah, the Blue, Blue Brigade. The Blue, sorry, yes. Yeah, the Blue Brigade, and that happens. That all happens quite quickly. Uh, and sadly, Quatermass gets dragged out the car. Annie asks to escape because he tells her to go. She gets away with the child, takes the child to a hospital. But then Quatermass has this really fascinating adventure in a scrapyard with loads and loads of old people, one of whom is Ethel Skinner from EastEnders. If anybody from England will understand who Ethel Skinner was. And I think that part three is absolutely my favourite section of the whole series. It might be one of my favourite episodes of any British TV programme ever. Because thanks to all the seasoned old telly actors, this is the only part of the film where nobody seems to over- be overacting and being over theatrical playing against John Mills. They're all understated. And Mills really, really shines in these scenes too because it's a lot of old hands playing these scenes in really nice sets. It seems to have real texture and it seems his feel for his character acting against this lot seems to really flourish and develop. I think it's terrific. But there's a bit in the book where Quatermass actually has to find his way there that's not in the serial. And it's fantastic. So he finds his way, he realises that he's in Hounslow in London and that section of gang warfare before he finds his way to the old folk settlement in the scrapyard is really, really grim. And I'm just, just going to read a bit. I'm just going to read a bit. He was in a backyard with drab grass and the remnants of rabbit hutches, then through the yard door into a lane. They would know where to look, which way to come. Back in the street, he heard an explosion. It sounded like a small bomb or grenade. There was a moment's silence, then an extraordinary screech that went on and on, angry as if something was trying to rid itself of its life. It must have succeeded because it stopped suddenly. They were shooting again, ferocious bursts long enough to empty magazines. The gang on the big barricade must have seized their chance and attacked. He made his way down the back lane, keeping low. It was where Dustman would have come to empty bins. He sensed air against his calf and looked anxiously down for blood. He might not feel the wound, he knew, but there was no sign of one, just the trouser leg ripped away from the knee down. The lane became blocked with brickwork. A wall had collapsed into it, some sort of workshop, probably a backstreet garage to judge by the battered roofs of cars he could see as he climbed over the pile. He glanced round and saw to his horror that he was directly in line with the bigger barricade, in full view of the dreadlocked figures clinging behind it. They were scarcely thirty yards away. He threw himself down amongst the clinking bricks. He waited and peered again. Their attention must have been all on their enemies. Guns were firing because the arrows being strung to crude bows. One youth swung a sledgehammer round and round to get speed before releasing it like a missile. There was a continuous high-pitched screaming. A number of the capering figures were undoubtedly female, their shapes picked out by their shining red upper garments. It took him a moment to realise that the shine was of sweating skin. The girls were bare to the waist, their breasts painted with some red grease, a taunt to the enemy, some sexual mockery at work. One of them was on top of the barricade now shrilling and gesturing across at the Blue Brigade. Before she could jump down, something hit her. A missile of wires and weights, probably from a crossbow. It almost severed the girl's head. She tumbled, choking, without a sound. It's fucking great. So you've got these nightmarish, like, Mad Max sections of bare-topped, grease-painted Amazonian women engaged in battle. With It's it's just incredible. And there's, there's other stuff as well, like feral dog packs, people hanged in weird gibbets with shop signs hanging from them saying everything must go and a supermarket full of rotting gang corpses in unpowered freezers, which they use as their, like, their, um, their mausoleum. It's, it's incredible. There's, like, pages and pages of this before he even finds his way to the scrapyard. It's absolutely brilliant. I wow. absolutely love it. Wow. Yeah, hardcore. Love it. Pretty hardcore. Yeah. Because you weren't but... going to read the novel originally, were you? you were, I think when we talked about this, we just talked about doing the TV show, but you obviously really got into the novel. Well, I, I just had to read it again because it was my introduction to Quatermass, yeah, right, so I thought, right. I thought I'm, I'm, I'm going to read it again. My original plan was to watch Beasts as well, the yes, um, yeah. because I got that on on DVD, and to watch the Quatermass and the Pit serial, but I just never got around to it. But yeah, if, if you can get hold of a copy of this, if you like this series, if you can get hold of a copy of this novelisation by Neil himself, it is fantastic, and it is a match for any NEL or any other 1970s Britain is completely knackered, apocalyptic stories. It's amazing. Of course, the other thing that's going on which throughout this, throughout series one and series, episode two and then three, is this whole notion that the, the aliens are also, the, whether it's the beacons underneath the, the sort of, you know, the monoliths or the aliens, because you don't see the aliens. The aliens are just this beam out in space. And I think the inference 
the inference at some point in the series is that the aliens have just got this automatic harvester mm. that has somehow been reactivated after centuries and it's just sort of harvesting the humans, harvesting the young people. But the whole young people are going crazy. It's only young people who join the planet people, and there's some lovely scenes. I think one of the astronomers that works at Joe Cap's satellite, she runs off and joins the planet people, and there's another scene yeah. where where a soldier just strips off his his kit and just joins the planet people, and then the the, yeah. the, the blue the blue brigades uh, is it the blue brigades? No, the blue jackets. The, yeah, the blue brigades. Yeah, the blue brigades uh, and the barters are joining the everyone. All the and it's only young people. And this is very Neil, I think, probably. It's only old people who seem to have some sort of stability and grip about what's going on and this, oh, we've got to do something about this. The young people are just all sort of basically going crazy and being harvested, Hmm. which is what I think that whole sequence, which is a lovely sequence, I agree, of Quatermass being in this sort of under – this underworld community, underground community in the scrapyard with with old people who are essentially out of the 1950s, hmm. drinking tea and singing old songs and, you know, it's all the, the blit, you know, the 40s and 50s, it's the blitz spirit and all that sort of thing, and the young people. And there's, so moving it on, that Quatermass is, is sort of taken at gunpoint from that group of old people and sort of recruited by the what's left of the British government to sort of come up with some sort of solution to fight this, hmm. which... It leads to another great series, which I'm sure is probably one of your favourite parts in episode three, two, where they go back to the TV show <laughs> and, and they're filming Tit Up Your Bumpity. Yeah, which Tit is, Up Your Bumpity. Yeah. Which is, and there's this sort of really camp, very obviously yeah. gay director who's sort of really bitchy and just saying, oh, this, that, you know, so it's got this sort of pseudo soft porn show. You know, and and, and they, they the soldiers come in and go right. This is stop, stop filming. We've got to take over your satellite link so we can patch in with America, to, so Quatermass can talk to the Americans about what we're going to do to try and fight the aliens. But you know, and, and the sort of the, the the director goes, "It's the only show anyone watches anymore on television. It's a family show." And of course, that's a that's a uh, a massive nod to you know that nineteen eighty six show, the year of the Sex Olympics. I think. Yeah. You know? Because he, which is also, which I, I didn't rewatch for this, but I have, I have seen before, you know. And, th- and then they try, and, and it, that's where Quatermass gets this whole, you know, the Russians and the Americans are trying to communicate with the aliens, and Quatermass has this whole thing of basically saying, "Look, a ripe crop can't appeal to a reaper," and I think this is gathering time. The gathering time, the human race is being harvested. Hmm. So there's a lot going on here, young young versus old, the aliens harvesting people, society, and there's this inference, which I don't really think is sort of pulled out in the television series as to, so what came first, the collapse or the sort of planet people, young, young people sort of just going crazy forming gangs, or mm. is the actual collapse and the young people forming gangs and becoming, becoming planet people, is that due to the aliens or did... Mm. Was it that that attracted the aliens to start sort of harvesting again? Well, it makes you think quite deeply about it all, doesn't it? What, what yeah. happens when organised society ta- starts to degrade and and what do the kids do, you know? And... Not a great place to be a, ch- a young person, Quatermass says in Series 1 when Cap, because Cap's very anti the kids, he hates the planet people, he's very yeah. technological, oh, these people, you know, they're just insane, they've given up, they're just, you know, they're ridiculous. Yeah, Cap is Cap is young Quatermass, isn't he? In many well, Qua- ways, Cap yeah. is young Quatermass or old Neil, arguably. Yeah. Yes, and whereas whereas John Mills is much more sort of like, well, I kind of I, because he's looking for his granddaughter, who we see at various mm. points in episode two and three, running around with Kickalong's mob. Yeah, um, he's quite he he gets he kind of gets it, even though he's not attracted to it. You can see why in this in this world, young people just want to escape it. Yeah, yeah, and and. Kick along is an interesting character in that he's just taking advantage of this entire. He, he was probably a complete dickhead before the Planet People movement even started, and he's just he's just compl- he's a, probably a narcissist, and he's completely exploiting yeah. this for his own purposes. He's a, That's right, you know, sociopath, and that that scene in the TV studio is you must have amazing. loved that. It's just amazing, and I think this is why for me episode three is peak telly because episode three has got 
the section in the graveyard in the scrapyard with the old people and it's got this section and you've got that wonderful scene that you've just referred to where Quatermass is in the TV studio you've got Chuck Marshall at NASA via the TV link and it keeps cutting back to a group of paratroopers who were the guys who came and got him from the scrapyard because Annie told them that he was... Oh, we haven't mentioned. The girl exploded. <laughs> Annie yeah, got oh. the girl Annie got the girl to hospital and she levitated off the bed and exploded into crystal. Didn't really get that, but really, I don't understand how that all fitted in, but whatever. Yeah. Sometimes but you anyway. just got to let art flow over you. Yeah, back to Tituppy Bumperty. <laughs> um, so you've got this... The, the cast of Tituppy Bumperty in their... the wearing sexy, skimpy frog, cat, elephant costumes... And they're with a group of paratroopers looking on in consternation at a TV screen. So you've got this really incongruous scene of a group of a group of people dressed as sexy animals. In the book, they also have phalluses and all sorts of other things and, 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 and simulate sex with each other. And they're looking on in fascination and consternation as, until Quatermass makes his revelation that the human race is being harvested, at which point uh, a dancer in a skinny... Frog bikini goes, oh, and faints in horror. <laughs> it's absolutely incredible. It's absolutely incredible. It's just great TV. But, of course, the other thing that we haven't mentioned is the girl Isabel has levitated off the bed and exploded in front of the doctor and nurses. And meanwhile, uh, Joe Cap has had to go and try and fix another um, site, uh, radar telescope site, something, which has been completely trashed by the planet people who were anti-technology. While he was aware, a bunch more planet people have come to the radio telescope site, which has standing stones nearby, very, very close to their um, their dwelling. And by the time is he gets back... Is that Ringstone Round? Was that, is it, Ringstone, it's, not, it's not Ringstone it's not Round. It's not Ringstone Round. Ringstone Round is another one that's quite close to them, but it's not the one that's directly That's right. Next Ringstone to Round is yes. like a, a, an hour or two walk away. Yeah. But they've okay. got a small collection of standing stones where Joe Cap's yeah. wife, who was an archaeologist, has been digging up beakers from the beaker people. So it's already established earlier in the series, in the story, that there is a beaker people site very close to where they live, literally 100 yards from their, from their house. And she'd been doing digging there, and had the world not gone to shit, she would have still been doing that work because she was a scientist herself. And of course, so planet people start to converge on this site, and unfortunately for Joe Cap, he gets back, and his entire family, including his children and his dog, have been burnt up. By a sky harvested. beam from They've the been sky. Harvested, harvested yep. by this alien harvester, yes. And then yeah. that throws him into a sort of existential depression, understandably, yeah. as you would. Yeah. While Quatermass is trying to figure out what to do. And of course, they're all, they're, they're all thousands of people are converging on Wembley. Yep. And this is the part, this is, I must admit, one part I wasn't quite sure about because I think they're congregating on Wembley. And at one point, Annie, Annie who's back in the picture, was back with Quatermass, says to Quatermass, I wonder what's under it. Yeah, and then the young nephew of the prime minister of one of the government people just points at Quatermass, and it's clear he wants the the gut that's the soldiers to kill Quatermass. Yeah, and I was wondering whether that that's the youth thing. He's quite young, so he's been infected by he's been oh absolutely taken taken over by what it, this this young person's anti old person mania that is seeing all these people congregate at various places and get harvested, and then there's a massive. Harvesting at Wembley, which mm-hmm. Quatermass, what what saves him from being shot by the by the soldiers is that that, that the, the the beam of light comes down and everyone is killed. And then there's that amazing scene and quite a gripping scene when Quatermass again and he gets killed because that's the other thing I think we should say about this series is it, it knocks off characters left, right, and centre. Mm. It's, it's it's quite mm. merciless with this. It doesn't matter how long they've been in the series or what they've been doing. He just knocks them off. So Annie gets killed. Hundreds of thousands of young people get harvested. And I think at the beginning of the part four is that Quatermass, who's in the d- deep down in the car park, emerges, covered in human dust. And he has that interaction with the pay cop and the pay cop's going, what? This is terrible. What's... And he can... the pay cop knows this, what, this is humans. And so the, the, the sky is mm. yellow. And then at times it's green, which is the harvesting machine spewing out all the stu- all the all the human re- remains or that's non protein that it wants to get rid of. Mm. Again, another reason why episode three is so good is it also concerns the Wembley scene. So yeah. it's it's a fucking terrific. You like three? Ep- yep, it is good. It is ter- good. Terrific episode. But again, the book has an additional passage, 
So the book doesn't just have the additional passage where he finds his way to the scrapyard, but has an additional passage after his meeting with the cabinet. And of course, it's that meeting with the cabinet where the Prime Minister's nephew mirrors Kickalong's language. When Kickalong, when they found Isabel, Kickalong says, and they try and stop the stop them taking her away. Kickalong says she didn't make it. You know, she she, she couldn't go. She didn't make it. And actually, the Prime Minister's nephew mirrors that language when Quatermass says that the girl essentially exploded and turned to crystal. He actually mirrors that language. He said she didn't make it. And he's definitely been taken by the same influence. But because... Mania, whatever, whatever it is. Yeah, the but same. because he's also an arsehole politician with, yeah. with pay cops at his, at his behest and he doesn't agree with anything that um, Quatermass is saying and sees him as an old fool, he just uses his power just to have him try and have him killed. Well, he sort but, of basically is killing Quatermass because he thinks Quatermass stands in the way of the harvesting, mm, which he yeah. he wants. You know, they, they want to go to this other planet. They want all the young people to go to this other planet. They think it's mm. the the new society on this other planet. So I'm not going to let this old bastard stop us. Mm. But there's a section of the book that's absent just before he and Annie go to Wembley. Mm. After witnessing the death of Chuck Russell and his Russian ast- astronaut co-pilot with the cabinet. Because of course they send a shuttle into space to try and get, try and detect whatever's up there. But essentially, they're trying to communicate yeah. it with us. Yeah. yeah, but but it fails. Well, after that, Quatermass actually goes to bed with Annie, the regional commissioner, and he tr- he wakes up realizing that he's trying to have sex with her, and feels immense shame and guilt, and has like a flashback and a and a semi dream of his of his dead wife, but Annie didn't seem to rebuff him or she seems to be really sympathetic to him just on a human level so he has an epiphany about the nature of the alien threat and it just being a a machine effectively that is just doing its thing that doesn't understand that people might have developed or people might be conscious or anything like that. it's just a machine doing its job just like sending a probe to mars to dig yeah. into soil and interrupting biological elements that might be under the soil and he has this epiphany about the nature of the alien threat while playing with Annie's boobs. So well, this first struck me when I read it, because it's the first example, and I remember this from the 80s, it's the first example I ever came across, Elder Rumpy Pumpy in the huh. fiction that I was reading. And there isn't really a lot of that about at all. And, you know, being close to Quake Mass's age now than I was when I first read it, I'm like, well, you know, duh. And, and in the book, right. it's 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 really matter of fact, but it's striking because Quatermass gets his rocks off whilst having an epiphany about an alien machine harvesting people and playing with uh, Annie's boobs. So the fact that Annie dies in the very next scene horrifically <laughs> carries so much more impact in the book. Right. Well, that's that was that's good too because I I never really got how Quatermass moved from A to B in terms of saying, oh, there's a machine that's harvesting us. I never really, yeah. he just sort of, he just sort of like, oh, yep, yeah, you've just got to float. You've just got to go with this guy. He's a genius. And he's, he sort of picked this up. It doesn't really come across as being clear why this is happening. And that's the, that's the weird thing, isn't it? So in, in yeah. the book, he's talking to her and he's, he's talking about this scenario with sending a probe to Mars and things living beneath the surface of Mars getting affected by this probe. Whilst he's also, consciously commenting to himself on how pretty her areola are. You know, it's not lascivious. It's really matter-of-fact and and really straightforward and really quite touching. And it just makes it all the more horrific when she gets harvested, when she she crashes the Land Rover in the the basement car park trying to escape the Pecos. She gets shot in the film, doesn't she? She gets... They run run away when the the nephew basically says to the soldiers, right, kill that guy. Yeah, and um, he tries to escape deeper into the car park, which saves Quatermass, but she gets shot. She does, but in, in the book, when they hit the pillar, she also breaks her neck, but she's still conscious. Oh, uh, and wow. it's quite it's quite horrific. It's, it's I gotta get this it's book. R- really quite horrific. You, you've got it. It's a fucking great book, and it's a real shame he wasn't just a novelist as well. And, and actually, when I read this, I I, I looked for an, an another I looked for another copy because the old copy I had years ago is long gone. No idea where it went. Probably fell apart, or somebody borrowed it, or I don't know. Long gone. So I ended up having to get this copy off eBay, or wherever I got it from. And I also found that he did Quatermass and Quatermass 2 paperbacks. Which I do have those, yes. But they're just the scripts. The yeah, not right. novelizations. Oh, so, which is a shame. I would have loved novelizations as well. So yeah, 
episode three, absolute peak telly. Just incredible. Just really, really good telly. But four's good too. And then and then in four, I don't know if you're about to say this, but in four, he realises that the only reliable people who he can pull together, so they decide that they've got to sort of lay a trap for the aliens. Yeah. Back at Joe Cap's satellite, and and that the only people that they, so what they're going to do is they're going to recreate a human mass gathering, the smell, the sound, make an electric image of the smell, a la Stone Tapes. I don't know if you can actually do that, but or in 1979, if you could do that, they're going to put it, and they're going to basically set up a an analog of a, of a million strong human gathering, get the aliens to get the alien machine to um, harvest it. And then they're going to launch a nuclear bomb, which that you know not enough to destroy the alien presence, but enough to make it sort of realise, oh Christ, these guys can fight back. We'll 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 leave off. Mm. And the only people, and I love this, the only people that he can trust to do this are all the old, are old people, old scientists, yeah. including all, half the people that, that he was in the underground bunker with. Yeah. Yeah, it's bringing them all back is wonderful, and of course, there's also the the super ancient guy we haven't mentioned when when Ethel I think smell. says, "Oh the yeah, we've guy, got, guy we've who... got a scientist here as well." Yeah, and yeah, he goes to right. see him, and this this old guy's, "Yes, I used to work for um, Piers and Gamble. I I can recognise a thousand and three different smells because he basically worked for a soap factory." And that's the first right, that's quote, right, that's the first right, quote to us is like, "Ugh," but then all Ooh, of a sudden. Just... Everything starts it, to come together, and you realise it becomes yeah, useful. Yeah, yeah, and you do have those wonderful scenes with all with all the old folks. I think one of them at one point collapses from exhaustion, just a, or just, just, a, no, or just, just from being old. Has a heart attack, just a little something, just a little aside. Yeah. Another one goes. I think it might even be the thief. I can't remember because one of the old guys is a sort of Cockney thief who, yeah, Crater Mass rings into this final final sort of uh, episode to steal things that they need for setting the trap for the aliens. Yeah, yeah, it is good. I, I think what you said about the stone tape does come into play here in that it is essentially there's a little bit of hack science fiction stuff coming into play here as as, as the, the solution to the problem, which is, you know, set up a, a machine which can recreate um, all of the things, all of the sensations that this alien machine needs to sense to know that something is there that it needs to harvest, but yeah. they're going to put a they're going to put a nuclear bomb underneath it so, <laughs> to send to send some feedback to to give it a sharp shock to make it realise actually you know things aren't as they should be so it will stop and it is a good episode and I think McCorkindale as Joe Cap I think because he's playing traumatised actually works a little bit better for me in this episode mm-hmm. as well mm-hmm. and there's a really nice moment where him and Quatermass have a quiet moment when everybody else has left. Because of course the set of the nuclear weapon, everybody else is like you know, good luck. But Quatermass essentially is uh, is going to sacrifice himself to try and save the world, and so is Joe Cap. But there is a touching moment where I think Kick Along and his gang turn up, and Quatermass's granddaughter is there right at the eleventh hour, right at the final moment, and Kick Along tries to stop things because of course his technology. He's busy. I think he shoots Tyre Wilcox in the back. Just I think he's a he bastard. shoots Joe Cap. Doesn't he shoot Joe Cap with his Sterling as well? He does. Yep. Yep. He's um, he's just generally being gone. a horrible. Everyone bastard. is gone. Ex- everyone's gone except Quatermass and Joe Cap. Yeah. Yeah. And all the British people, all the British Army people who are helping them, they're really old as well. Yeah. So there's only old people who are yeah, pulling this right. last a last little bit together. It's a real sort of like spit and polish. Dunkirk spirit, you know, all these old yeah. people. It's quite quite like it. It's clever and it, it it pulls a whole lot of strings that have happened throughout the last couple of episodes together really nicely. Yeah. That is a really nice detail actually that you just pointed out that all the army guys all look fifty or sixty. Well, they're, they're all, all grey haired. They only can have old because you can't trust these people who are gonna sort of turn planet people and go crazy and start shooting people and stuff like that. That's right, and the the young soldier who turns planet people um, to anybody who watched British soaps in the nineteen eighties was Brian Tilsley from Coronation Street, who <laughs> oh, interestingly was hugely popular as an actor on Coronation Street, and he was written out, they killed the character, so he could go to Hollywood and find his fortune in Hollywood, and I only ever saw him in one thing. He has one line in RoboCop Two, as a journalist asking a question of the OCP chief executive. So there you oh, go, there you go. It's, factoid. It's it's a tough gig. It's a tough it is gig. a tough gig. Kick along and his gang turn up, don't they? Quatermass's granddaughter is there. 
Toya Wilcox is their son's baby now. She'd had the baby earlier. You don't know why she ain't got the baby anymore, but you know in the book it's because Kick Along or one of his mates grabbed it off her and just threw it on the floor and made her leave it behind. And uh, his granddaughter turns up and she they have that moment of bonding, that very last moment. But there's just that, before we get to that, there's that really quiet moment between McCorkindale and John Mills at the dish site before the planet people turn up where it's just the two of them. With a, with steaming mugs of tea, which Ethel has left them. She left them a flask to make sure they had something to and drink some while they were waiting. And some singers. And Quatermass gets a really apt line. He says, perhaps evil is just another man's good. That's the cosmic law. And that, ladies and germs, is our Moorcock connection for today. <laughs> yeah. So there we go. This is a Moorcock flavoured podcast, so we've got our Moorcock connection there. There you go. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Although, really, thinking back, I probably should have just made this uh, a, a Pops-flavoured podcast because everything we talk about on this podcast originally came to me via Pops. But anyway, that's our connection. And, yeah, it works. So Quatermass has a heart attack. Mm, just as kick along, Just as Kickalong's planet people are coming and they're, they're basically going to you know, start smashing up the, the radio stuff and upending the experiment. And, and and just as as quite a mess, and of course it's very B science fiction. There's a red knob that has to be pushed, <laughs> That's right. which is totally B science fiction. The red knob and quite a mess can't quite get to the red knob because he's having a heart attack. Sees his sees his his, his granddaughter, and she helped. They have this bot. They have this lovely little bonding thing, and she just has this moment of, Christ, I've got to help him. And they mm-hmm. both very actually very, they have this moment of, you know, both pressing the bomb and. Then we're then we're back into this bucolic future after the radiation's cleared and there's kids running around and cows and mm. yes we find out the aliens never came back. Mm. Children in a meadow and butterflies and cows. Yeah, yeah. and was it also yeah. the, the the nursery rhyme again? Was someone singing the nursery rhyme again? I think maybe kids were singing the, the girls were singing mm. the nursery rhyme. Mm. Pretty effective so, dystopia, I think. Pretty effective. Oh, you know what? Great, great, great serial, great television. Um, it's great that ITV took this on when B- the BBC seemed to get cold feet about it and put it out there. But the book, if you like this serial, get a copy of the book because it's just got those extra embellishments and it is it is the equal of any other 70s apocalyptic near-future British fiction. It's absolutely fantastic. So, yeah, good stuff. Now, it's a real shame that Neil never did more Quatermass, but I know in that... Um, that book that we've got here, uh, Into the Unknown, The Fantastic Life of Nigel yes, Neal. Yes, which I, I looked at before we did this. Yes, I do have that. Mm. There are references to some almost but not quite Quatermass stories that never quite came off. One, I think, was set in World War Two, which was called, I think it was tentatively titled Quatermass and the Nazis, <laughs> which is oh, yeah. a, sh- a schlockier name as you, as that you could possibly That would have been Brian for. Don Levy with the Sten... <laughs> Just, you know, sort of doing a Leonardo DiCaprio scene from, yeah. you know, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, just bursting into a gang of Nazis and killing them. Absolutely. Yeah, because Don Levy does get his moment with a submachine gun in Quatermass too, doesn't that's he? That's right, that's right. Yeah. Yes. Man, man of action, yeah. And, um, well, let's, I'm just going to pop into the index section because there's a few of these titles that appear wow. in the index. Quatermass and the Ultimate Conspiracy. Yeah. This was the Quatermass conclusion. I've referred to it as the final solution a couple of times, but no, it's the Quatermass conclusion was the TV version. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Quatermass, Quatermass, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, Quatermass in the Third Reich. It wasn't Quatermass and the Nazis. It was Quatermass in the Third Reich. So, unfortunately, I've just embellished that in my own head. So, Almost. But my head canon, now there is a Quatermass and the Nazis unmade series, but it was Quatermass in the Third the third. Almost sort of like he could have almost been quite God, quite sort of Doctor Whoish, couldn't he? Mm. Could have been yeah. all over the place, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But I suppose if you ever want anything that vaguely approximates Quatermass for more Quatermass fix, then you just got to watch things like um, Inferno or The Claws of Axos or any of a handful of John Pertwee stories from the first couple of series to get anywhere close to this stuff because I think this stuff does sit as pretty unique amongst British TV. There is other similar stuff. There's apocalyptic stuff, but I don't think there's another character really like Quatermass. He was like, and, and because you've got different actors playing him and slightly different takes on him, he's almost like in a, in a mild way, the, the James Bond of scientists ah, in ah, fiction, ah, you know, I and I, I do so. like it. 
And what I need to do now is pull my finger out and watch the the serials that are still available. So Andrea yeah, Morel plays him in the in the Quatermass okay, Pit series from know. the late I don't 50s. know who that is. Who's that? Who's you, that? You'd recognise him as soon as you saw him. He was in oh, right. tons and tons of of movies and British TV from around the time. Yeah, so you, you would totally recognise it. Yeah, the, but the, yeah. The, the... The, the show that I was thinking about this, because as I say, going right, circling right back to the beginning, thinking, did I find this as terrifying in 1990 as I did now? Because it was actually really, you know, it's quite creepy. And I had the I had the ringstone round and the lay, lay, lay thing running in my head for ages. And it reminded me of a 2006 film called Children of Men. Great film. Great film, but also absolutely terrifying dystopia yeah um and with the with the, with the youth sort of thing because of course it's a, it's about a world where people can't have children anymore so uh it, yeah and, and 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 then all of a sudden a refugee is found a refugee a young african refugee woman is found pregnant what do mm. you do mm. so it, that and the other thing just another little cultural sort of snippet a, no, a terrific 1964 novel called Only Lovers Left Alive. Have you heard of that? For some reason, is there a film called Only Lovers Left Alive? No, well, there was. It, it was a vampire film, but it's got nothing to do with... Oh, right, I'm thinking with, of so, something else then. Yeah, yeah. So, so it was by Dave Wallace, and it's a 1964... I did I did an article, I did an essay about it in that book, Girl Gangs, Biker Boys and Real Cool Cats, and it's basically about this Britain where just everyone over a certain age commits suicide. Hmm. And the young people are left to basically run society, and they form and they're sort of so they're all the young motorbike gangs are running society, and they're having sort of wars with each other. And there's a there's a there's a royalist biker gang that operates out of out of Buckingham Palace, and there's <laughs> it's it's really brilliant. It's a terrific. I mean, Wallace only did a couple of novels and wasn't really one at one stage the stones were going to remake it and you know right. it was going to be we're going to make it and it was all going to be really big but then they lost interest or took too many drugs so yes yeah, some so it links to that children of men it also links to other culture where young people are kind of in charge or taking charge you know like things like um only lovers left alive there's a great american film called panic in the streets 1968 mm. film about young people were basically put you know, ecstasy in the water and lock up everyone over 25 <laughs> and it's like you know because that youth thing that's a dominant theme in this is they're young people the young people are out of control they've lost it mm. and it's it's the old people that the blitz generation that have to seize it back mm. and get get it back on the straight and narrow and teach those aliens what for the, the more i think about it the more i really regret that there isn't more british tv like this you know. Wasn't there a Quatermass remake recently? I know there was a lot. Didn't the BBC read? It's uh, got Mark the, Gattis in it, who we just get Mark yeah. Gattis now for anything vaguely science fiction you know. It was recently, as in about 20 years ago, I think. Was it, um, oh, was it any yeah, good? It was, no, it was. But it, it's interesting in that they did it as. Essentially, they did a, 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 com, a condensed version of the Quatermass experiment and they, and they broadcast it live as part of. Um, an anniversary, like a British TV anniversary or something. I can't remember, but it had Jason Fleming, um, Mark Gatiss, and uh, David Tennant oh. all were all in it. And you know what? It's okay as watching a TV play, um, but it was it was too heavily condensed, and I wasn't a big fan of the performances. Jason Fleming plays Quatermass, and you know what? I really should do is rewatch it because I think I watched it at the time. Mm. And I probably watched things with different expectations in those mm. days, mm. and I don't, I don't think I've seen it since. So it's something, I should, and I think I might have it on DVD somewhere. Mm. Um, look, I've got a DVD. Oh no, I've got a DVD of the Stone Tape, but for some weird reason, it's not got anything else by Nigel Neal on it. It's twinned with a series. Sorry, not a series. Uh, a broadcast of something called Ghost Watch that was on oh, British yes. TV. Yes, yes, which yes, yep. which was like a. a a mock d- documentary that that was also a little bit mischievous that everyone with... thought was real, and it was kind of that's like right. war. That's like the Awesome Worlds, War of the Worlds, yeah, radio yeah. podcast. I've never seen it, but I've heard all about it. Yes, yeah. I don't know why those two things were twinned up for a DVD double bill, but yeah, I've got that. Well, well yes, weird I, I... British. I don't know, cult. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, but I do think my dad's got that on DVD, so maybe I will nab that off my dad next time I see him yeah. and give it a look. Okay. Yeah, but anyway, that was Quatermass. So, you know what? 
thanks for coming back to talk about Quatermass and joining us in Derry and Tom's and sitting there in glorious weather drinking whiskey while I <laughs> drank here in the freezing fucking cold Vimto. But, All right, well, enjoy your Vimto. Yeah, I've finished it now. But actually, yeah. it's 11.25 now, so the sun will almost be past the yard arm in 35 minutes, or would be if I could actually see the sun. Because all I can see is cloud. It's not, and rain. it's not yellow. It's not covered in yellow. It's not a yellow sort of cloudy mist, is it? It's not. Fortunately, it isn't. But I do have something lined up, which has been sitting here on my desk for absolutely ages, which I think I might crack at lunchtime and have with something to eat, which is um, Omnipolo Imperial Jewel Must Holiday Sour. This is left over from a batch of beers that I got for Christmas, and it's 5.9%. I think it's Dutch or Belgian. So I'm going to give that a go with some lunch in 35 that, that, minutes. That's, that's you out for the afternoon. Yeah, yeah probably. So, Absolutely. But you know what? It is always a pleasure to catch up with you Anytime. again and listen to your Anytime. thoughts about these things. And I really, really look forward to your next book, which reminds us what it's called, the your co-edited called, book of it's essays. It's called Revolution in 35 Millimeter. Political Violence and Resistance in Film from the Art House to the Grind House, 1950 to 1990. Out with through PM Press later this year. Fantastic. Look forward to it. So thanks again, and we'll catch you on the flip side. No worries. Massive thanks to Andrew for joining me for the third time in Derry and Tom's. It's been a year of thirds so far. I wonder if there's some cosmic significance to this. As a Manxman, I'm sure Nigel Neal would agree and probably approve. You can find Andrew on all the usual social media channels under the tag Pulp Curry, and his website is pulpcurry.com. You can pre-order Revolution in 35mm, Political Violence and Resistance in Cinema from the Art House to the Grindhouse, 1960-1990, at PM Press and the usual big online retailers. PS Publishing's latest Midnight Movie monograph, Bride of Frankenstein, featuring Andrew, is available at pspublishing.co.uk. Horwitz Publications, Pulp Fiction and the Rise of the Australian Paperback is available via the Anthem Press website, as well as other retailers. And his crime novels Ghost Money, Gunshine State and Orphan Road are available at the usual retailers too, you can also subscribe to his newsletter via andrewnetty.substack.com. Since recording this, I looked up the character actor Percy Herbert that we talked about, and there is a fascinating actor and story. Not only was he in The Bridge on the River Kwai, but he actually worked on the real bridge as a prisoner of the Japanese in World War II, and acted as a consultant to director David Lean on the film, in addition to his acting role. As is often the case when I do these shows, I also end up on Bandcamp, panning for gold, and I found some, so stay tuned at the end and I'll play this episode out with Superstar by Quatermass 3. Since our last episode, talking about IP spin-off novels, my old mate Rich dropped me a line to tell me of some of his favourite early experiences with spin-offs from well-established TV sci-fi, and other things, including spin-offs from the British kids' TV shows Grange Hill and Tucker's Luck, the former, Rich informs me, involving an exchange trip to Germany in which Gripper tries to buy Nazi memorabilia and almost gets sexually assaulted for his troubles. I've said it before, but kids' TV in the 70s and early 80s was a very different proposition to today's. He also mentioned the Doctor Who spin-off, Harry Sullivan's War, written by Harry Sullivan actor Ian Martyr. That was a Target book too, so I've no idea how that passed me by, but Martyr did write quite a few Who novelisations too, and he was co-writer on the never-made Tom Baker Who movie, Doctor Who Meets Scratchman, one of the great what-ifs of the universe. And I'm sure he would have gone on to write many more novels had he not died of a heart attack on just his 42nd birthday. And, I had this, but had forgotten all about it, V East Coast Crisis by Howard Weinstein and A.C. Crispin. It's easy to forget now how much of an event the first V miniseries was, and I think I might have got this book for Christmas. It was cool. Rich said it was his first ever experience of staying up till 2am reading because he was so gripped by it. It's the only V novel I ever read, but from a quick online search it looks like there were more than a dozen of them. But I suppose by that point, the mid-80s, I was all about Mocock, Sven Hassel, and the myriad of the weird and obscure sci-fi and fantasy I was getting off Pops, so they never really stood a chance. Thanks though, Rich. And thanks as always to our patrons for keeping this show on the road. First, those without tear, Anthony Picanti, Tim Cardos, Dave Dempster and Sebastian Weetabix. 
and our chaos engineers Andrew Cicluna, Andrew Spong, Andrew Van Ness, Anthony Porter, Benjamin Fletcher, Brandon Mays, Dan Charnley, Dave Griffiths, Dave Voxman, Gabriel Laycock, Harvey Faulkner Aston, Jim Kirkland, Jim Jupp, John W. Lays, Jules Lawrence, Mal Pertwee, Mary Catherine, Matt Saltz, Nelbert, Ofa Ziv, Paul McRandall, PJ Cooper, Scott Butler, and Simon Perrins, and our crafty jugaderos Alexander Harris, Christian Hundal, Ilium Weston Ra, Liam Turner, Laws, Mark Taylor, Matthew Broom, Graham Holden, Toby White, and Vanassis Beltzios, and eternal thanks to our patron demons Alistair Davison, Andy Clark, Andy Darby, David Lee, Fred Keish, Gareth Wilson, Glenn Sawyer, Greg Faulkner, Gwen Barlow, Ian Stead, Imria, Jenny Stim, Jason Vogel, Jay Risa, Joe Monty, Lee Gary, Mark Hebden, Marius Latowskis, Miles Reed Labato, Neil Burton, Paul Hillary, Randall Gatlin, Steve Round, Tom Murphy, Tony Malazzo, the OG patron Norman Beresford, and last but never least, Robert McMillan. That's enough from me. Don't forget you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram with the handle at Breakfast Ruins. You can email us at breakfastruins at outlook.com. The webpage is breakfastintheruins.com. We have our Patreon page too. There are a few extra odds and sods on there. But for now, take care. Stay safe. We will meet again soon on the Moonbeam Rods.
Poppity, poppity, ring stone round. If you lose your hat, it will never be found. So pull up your breeches right up to your chin and fatten your cloak with a bright new pin. When you are ready, then we we'll begin. begin. Poppity, poppity, puff. Poppity, poppity, puff. <sighs> 